Nevertheless, I did do some brainstorming on like random things like the definition of intelligence and just things here and there. I've already talked about a lot of the stuff um, from when I was 18 though. Um, when I was 19, I got my creativity back, like my original creativity plus a whole lot more. The amount of contributions I made when I was 19, dude, I wouldn't even know where to start. I'm not going to, I can't go through all of them. There's no way. Actually, I think I, I know where to start. I know where to start. A good, this is my contribution when I was 19, okay? And it's how to get your creativity back, how to be creative. This is something that so many people want to know, and I have a formula for it. Like, I have a step-by-step -step guide on how to get your creativity back. Not like how to be creative in the moment, but how to literally get it back so that when you're in any situation, you can be more creative always. And um, this might seem counterintuitive at first when I say it, but let me elaborate, okay? Okay. The three things that I attribute to me being able to be creative is ignorance, boredom, and limiting myself. Actually, for like half the people, for like, let's say like the bottom 50% of people in intelligence, I don't say ignorance. I, uh, ignorance comes with some implications. I say acting without thinking. And it makes more sense when I say that um, for, uh, with less explanation, but I'll explain how ignorance is actually the correct word and it's more accurate. I'll explain both. Um, so let me tell you a story. Okay. I told this story before, I think, but um, I'll say it again. So one day, I think it was in like September of 2019. Um, my brother Furhas was constantly trying to make improvements, like many little improvements to his music studio. And now at this point, for about like six months, he had been wanting to replace his flooring um, from carpet to wood or like vinyl or tile or something. I don't know why. I mean, carpet is more comfy um, for your feet to just like sink your toes in. But whatever, man, you do what you want. So I was helping him. And I've always tried to make it a priority to assist him in stuff like this. Like, fulfill managerial duties without actually being his manager. So at this point, it was like, he, I've seen what his laziness is capable of. So I'm like, I'll do all the work. I, I literally told him, I'm like, I'll go to Home Depot today and bring you a bunch of wood samples um, so that you can just choose from them. And he's like, no, no, no. I'll, I'll, I'll pick out the wood for myself. And I'm like, okay. Next day I go to him, I ask him. I do, put these things in my notes. I, I go to him, I'm like, did you pick out a wood? No. Next day, no. Day after that, Afra, stop asking me every day. I'll get to it. Okay, fine. I wait a week and I ask him, did you pick out a wood? No, not yet. I keep asking. One month goes by. Two months go by. And finally he gets fed up and he goes like, I'll pick it out soon, Okay. And I go like, set a deadline, okay? It's just to pick something. You're not even spending any money yet. This is like, you want to be this like big and famous person within a year, yet you can't even take two months to decide on something that is like 0.0001% of the work to do to, to, to end up in your goal. Like you think it's like a status, it's like a progress bar. You want to reach the end of the progress bar after a year, yet it takes you two months to put one pixel in there. You think you're going to reach the, the end of the progress bar by the end of that? You want to be this big successful mission? You think you can even do it in your lifetime? Because at the rate you're going, you'll never be successful with, with this lazy work ethic. And I, I told him, I'm like, do it by tomorrow. Set a, At least set a deadline for it. And he goes like, okay, I'll pick it. And I go to him the next day. And I, I ask him, and he's like, oh, I, I've narrowed it down to uh, eight options. And then I, I go to him the next day, and he's like, I've narrowed it down to four options. I go to him the next day, I've narrowed it down to two options. The next day, he's like, I've decided what what would I want. I'll go to Lowe's, and I'll talk to them within a week. What the? Within a week? Fine, whatever. One week goes by. Two weeks go by. 
One month goes by. Two months go by. I get so fed up. I ask him, I'm like, did you even pick a wood? And he goes, never mind, I'll keep the carpet. But really, I, ha I had a suspicion that he was just being lazy and he actually didn't want to keep the carpet. Um, and that he was lying when he said he wanted to keep the carpet. And my suspicion was confirmed later on that year, or not that year, a year after that, because when the place got flooded and my parents were replacing the flooring, and this is right after coronavirus popped off, um, my brother said he wanted wood flooring. So my parents put it in, not my brother. My parents did it. This dude would never do things. He would just wait for things to happen to him. People like to talk about how they want to do big things, how they can visualize themselves, like in two years running the game, but they can't visualize themselves doing a simple thing a, a tomorrow. They can't, they can't visualize the steps to get to that point. Because if they did, if they did start to put, put things in a step-by-step -step order and break things down and say, okay, if I want to achieve being a billionaire in five years, that means I have to make 200 million years million dollars per year and that means i have to make um like i don't know what 15 million or something i don't know what the hell it is um like 15 million a year or something 15 million a month or something so how the hell am i gonna end up making all this money every single day they never break it down but but you ask these people and they'll say yeah i can be a billionaire in five years but they never break it down if they did they'd go like Shit, well, how can I make half a million dollars tomorrow? Oh, I, yeah, no way. If they broke it down, they'd realize how stupid what they're saying actually is. But they don't do that. They just, they don't think about it. And I think they, they don't do it because there's a, there's a part of them that's insecure. That tells them not to think about it. Because if they did, they'd realize how lazy they actually are. And I think the solution to this is to is not necessarily to think about it. I think it's a stop thinking. I think it's a stop thinking and just do it. Like what happens if he fails? In his scenario, what's the worst case scenario if he fails? Worst possible outcome? Okay, he loses a little bit of money, not even his, his dad's money, and gets a new kind of flooring that a lot of people would like because Home Depot and Lowe's don't even sell flooring that everyone hates. You can... Like, let's say he fucks up so badly and he gets like, I don't know, tile flooring or something. I don't know. Just an example. Who cares? Like, actually, who cares? Just fucking do it. Stop thinking and just act. But if we're talking about bringing out our creativity, does this actually do it? Does this, does this make you more creative? You see, in, in my opinion... Creativity needs to be built up. It's a habit. It's a, it's a way of thinking. And you need to build that habit. And slowly, little by little, doing these things one at a time, acting without thinking, that will bring out the creativity uh, naturally in the things that you end up doing. It's not a creative way to be creative in the moment, but it's a way to build up that creativity. See, when I said acting without thinking, that's a lie. I, I just lied. That's a complete myth. You don't ever act without thinking. If you aren't thinking, you actually are. You just aren't aware that you're thinking. You're, you're just trusting your unconscious mind to take over for you without actually being consciously aware of your thought process. And if you let your unconscious mind make decisions for you, eventually the failures and successes will incentivize and desensitize your mind to improve. It's a natural system within us. Like the game structure. It's kind of like a deep um, machine, uh, deep learning neural network uh, with like a built-in core command to enjoy games that comes straight from nature. And it doesn't need to be nurtured into existence. So by practicing this, yeah, you risk screwing up. You risk failing. But you can't go anywhere worth going if you aren't willing to stumble around and hit the walls and fall and hurt yourself on the path to get there. You don't think about it, you just do it. And you build the intuition. You trust that your unconscious will pick up on the patterns 
and figure out the right way to go about going there without continuously bumping into walls. You, you trust that your unconscious will learn to be more creative than your conscious. And that's why the prefrontal cortex is basically inactive when people are freestyling. Because being creative isn't something you can really put all that much effort into and not have diminishing returns, severe diminishing returns, quickly. It's, it's a natural thing. It's an effortless habit. People always say, oh, it's so hard to be creative. They're right. Trying to force creativity is nearly impossible. It's a habit that you build up. And, and they're absolutely right when they say, oh, some people are able to do it so effortlessly. Yes, it's an effortless task. And it's not even a task. The best way I can describe creativity is it's not a task. It's not a, it's not a mission. It's a habit. It's a state of mind. It's something you can get good at and, and build up over time. They've done brain scans on people in flow state, like how I said with people freestyling. They don't actually consciously think about it all that much. They're not making decisions. They just train their animal brain to do it better. And the animal brain, with its infinite adaptability and, and godlike learning ability, learns to freestyle naturally using the same level of effort that it takes to you know, stay inside road lanes or, or type on a keyboard or like speak a language or ride a bike. Like you build these habits of making your unconscious mind um, a better decision maker, a more creative decision maker. And the best way to do it, well, one of the ways to do it, actually, no, the best way, best way is to act without necessarily thinking. You just do. But there was another problem with Ferhaz. He would always he would always be on a screen of some kind. He'd get drunk, he'd get high, he'd spend a lot of time on Twitter, on Instagram. And this was around that same time. And by this time, I had already got my creativity back. I, I'd had it back for a while. Um, and I had suspicions of what did it. Like I, I had stopped watching all movies and TV shows, and I think that may have helped. I started eating more salt. Um, that's not, that's a change I made in my life that I've seen be have an extremely strong correlation with my creativity, but I don't know if there's any causation there at all. So I'm not going to make any conclusions. Um, I think this one, the, I started waking up with the sunlight rather than an alarm. I completely abandoned using an alarm. Different things. I, I just, I threw stuff at the wall and, and saw what stuck. And I got my boost in creativity in... February of 2019. Um, or, so it was, it, was, it was around that time. It was in between January of 2019 and March of 2019. And it, it sort of gradually grew throughout that time until it was at its, its peak for the whole year. And around September of 2019, I was still in that phase where I literally couldn't operate regularly because I was constantly thinking of so many new ideas. Like I would have to, I would write them all down and because I could only type at like 60 words a minute, I would literally be losing like million dollar ideas as I was writing them because my typing speed couldn't keep up. Like I think of three ideas, write one down and lose the other two. I've lost billions of dollars worth of ideas in the shower. And I didn't even have any control over it. For like that whole year, ideas just came to me involuntarily. 2019 was... was a fever dream year of my life. I had no control over it. So I I had an idea in my head as to what was giving me this creativity, but I wasn't 100% sure. And I'm actually still not still 100% sure. I have good guesses. I can make an inference, but um, nothing definitive. So with this whole like redesigning the studio, right? This is a part of that. And um, he wanted to replace the ceiling fan with some kind of fixture, maybe like a light fixture or something, maybe a sound diffuser. Um, so we're sitting at, at a table and I think of some ideas. It, it just came to me, it, you, as it usually does. It's effortless. I didn't do anything for it. I didn't make an attempt to think of ideas. He just mentioned he wanted um, to make a light fixture, and I just thought of a bunch of ideas. And um, I look at them now, and it, they retroactively, like, 
they all follow design principles of like balance and unity yet at the same time they're so novel that i've literally never seen them done in a studio or anything even like them and that shit would be it would be so out of the way for people who didn't want to be distracted but for people who looked up and took a long look at it it would feel like they're in another dimension and you know what it was also easy to make like i could have made it myself with blocks of wood and it completely it was next level dude my designs they they defied depth perception it was going to incorporate like vanta black or like mooseville black now i'm not saying exactly what it was because i still think it's a really good idea and i want to actually put it in somebody's studio if my brother's going to be lazy and not do anything about it, I, I want somebody to have it. So I think of these ideas, and one idea in particular, and it takes me a second. Um, and it also incorporates lighting, and it hides the LED strips, it hides the bulbs, it hides the electrical outlet. And uh, you can even hook up a wireless router with umbrella Wi-Fi, and it would hide that too. And I think of this, um, and, and a few more ideas. Literally, it's not even that it takes any effort. It's not even that I'm thinking it. It's like I'm a power limiter. It's like there's some other being inside of me that has all these ideas already generated. And whenever, like, whenever it feels like creating ideas, it just does it. And I'm a limit. I'm the, I'm the bottleneck of it. I'm the bottleneck of this bottle of ideas. That's the way I, I can describe it. I am the bottleneck of the this bottle of ideas and sometimes I can not not always but sometimes I can pry open the um cap of the bottle and and you know reach into it and take some ideas sometimes it was rare it was difficult it was like if I wanted to generate ideas for something I don't actually need to do it I would just open my mind and let it flow and my head would just be populated with ideas I didn't even need a train of thought. I didn't need any, any inspiration or anything like that. That shit was unreal, dude. I don't have that now. I have a tiny portion of it. A little bit of it still remains. Um, and sometimes I get something out of it. Like once every couple months or so. But not. it's, it's, it's not like it used to be. So we're thinking, we're considering, okay, what kind of thing would we want on the ceiling? So he goes on his phone. And he goes on Google Images and looks up music studio ceilings just to get some ideas and i yell at him i literally yell like i cannot stress to you enough it was like the people around us were like freaked out they like it was like shocking um i go like hey stop don't look at that and remember i had an idea as to what was making me so creative but i didn't i didn't realize i didn't know fully i, I didn't know what the hell i was doing like i don't know why i told him to stop but i did it was just natural, natural for me. I wasn't even in control. And I don't even know why I was so angry with him. It was just a gut feeling to like be angry at what he was doing. And I know now, I have a good good guess now. I can't know for sure, but I have a good guess as to what, what it was now. It was like, my. I think, I think, again, I'm not sure. I think my thought process was that if he can't fill his head with ideas in the short term, it'll give him tunnel vision. In the medium term, it'll kill his creativity. And in the long term, it'll ruin his life. And he asked me why he shouldn't look at Google Images. And I couldn't explain it back then. I didn't know why myself. I just knew that that was wrong. But I told him, I was like, try to think of something yourself. Try to think of an original idea. And he was like, I can't. And I understood. Like, I've been there. Like, where do I even start, right? It's not, a creativity is not something you build overnight. Rome wasn't built in a day. I remember what that's like, you know, to not be able to think of anything vividly. I had writer's block. I remember the pain of writer's block. I cried in front of Faraz thinking about writer's block, talking about him with it. So I, I tell him, I'm like, I, I, know what you're, I know what you're saying, but just try, just try. And we try for like an hour I put a piece of paper and a pencil in front of him, tell him, like, just draw something, just to try. And for literally, like, an hour of, like, painstaking effort, he wasn't putting in much effort. But on my part, it was painstaking effort. He couldn't think of anything. And I remember he was getting really upset about it. And if you ask me, 
he should have he should have been way more upset. He should have tried way harder, and he should have gotten upset to the point where he cried. Because crying makes you grow stronger, and it makes you realize that something needs to change. But he didn't want to. He didn't care all that much. And then, like after that hour, he just went back to relying on Google Images. Now, now think about exactly what he did. He went back to relying on Google Images. For what exactly? Not for an idea, not so he can think, but so Google Images can think for him. Machines are doing the jobs of, our, of humans. They're doing the jobs of our minds. Some of these jobs should be done by machines, in my opinion. All accountants should be out of the job um, in the next few years if their employers have any common sense. But some jobs that are actually fun, you know, the ones that require thinking, they're also being replaced. But you can counter this in your life if you just think for yourself and you don't let the machine think for you. And that's what technology does. It does the jobs for you. It thinks for you. And the way to know if a certain technology is good or not is to look at it like this. Does the technology replace a job that people enjoy? Like cars replace long-term transportation, right? Fantastic technology. Um, it's te it's a, some Cars do a thing that we, we cannot do in real life. So I think it's a great technology. I like it. But Google Image, the way it's used, sometimes it's great. Sometimes, however, people use Google Images for inspiration and for replacing your creativity and your, your need to think about original, cool visuals. Listen, for some people, this might be good, okay? But for me, I like to keep my brain creative. I want to do this myself. When you start looking at the world like this, you start realizing that getting high and drunk and doing all these things should only be done rarely, if ever, because it does the job that your brain should already be doing. It also doesn't take long until people, you know, when I talk to them, for them to realize that like CNN and Fox and NBC, they replace, they do the job for you that you should be doing, which is something very, very crucial that you need to be doing yourself, which is developing a perception of the world, is developing your worldview. You watch any of these and you don't need to develop a worldview. That job will, will be done for you. All of these technologies replace something that your brain either should be doing or could be doing. And the worst one of them all is social media because it replaces probably the most vital aspect of your brain your function to to think spend time on social media if you want your thinking to be done for you and if you spend enough time on it you'll forget how to think freely altogether cryptography in my opinion is a great technology so is video editing and animation and photoshop Fuck it, bro. The Kanye West stem player, uh, which I believe is is a ripoff of the open source software Splitter. But regardless, that shit's amazing. I think video games, there's, depending on the game, there's good games like uh, uh, first three Halo games and Reach as well. Um, Reach was a bit ambitious, though. Mario Sunshine, um, Ocarina of Time, Minecraft... You know, you know the drill, you know how it goes. And then there's bad games, like Fortnite's um, most new Roblox games. All EA games, pretty much all of them, with few exceptions. Um, almost all mobile games, Raid Shadow Legends, um, you know, League of Legends. Uh, actually, I think as much hate as League of Legends gets, I think League of Legends is actually not the worst of... I think League of Legends actually is good for some people. I think it's on the fence for some people. Good for a few. Bad for most. Bad for 99% of the people that play it. Actually, that's not even like a... That's not a controversial take or anything. I think people know that. I think some people um, who are like exceptional League of Legends players... Like, I'd never tell a uh, faker like, Hey, stop playing League of Legends, bro. Like, nah. <laughs> that's his calling. And um, even the... 
League of Legends is so clowned on because even though people know that, even though people know how bad of a game it is, they still play it. But with these other games, you can convince them and they stop playing it a lot of the time. League of Legends is super addicting. And just like what I was saying before, the creativity comes from building habits. After, after like years of going like, I need to be creative and convincing your brain that it needs to be creative and, and forcing your brain to actually work on these things, you're going to have a few failures in the beginning because your brain won't be able to do it. But after enough time of, of telling your brain, hey, this is a skill you need to have, your brain will respond. It'll go like, all right, rev up those, those novel unused connections. And then you go on social media to like think of jokes and stuff and your brain will go like, wait, we don't need to do the thinking. There's something here doing it for us. We can relax. We can take it easy. We don't need to go through that effort. This false alarm. I don't know why you were saying that we have to come up with jokes on our own. We can just take the jokes from social media and, and laugh in our own head because of it. So what's, what's the big deal? Thinking is overrated if there's this thing that can think for us. And after, you know, after building a habit of letting these things into your life that think for you, eventually, eventually, slowly, but eventually, you'll forget altogether how to think. Completely. And this works the other way around as well. After a long time of cutting these things out of your life and forcing your brain to think, um, to, to do all the creative parts for you, you'll eventually pick it back up and, and be a natural again. So, how do you develop this habit? Acting without thinking is one of them. But my... My thing that I like to teach people, that's a that's a obvious one um, when you really think about it. But my thing that I like to really teach people is boredom. You see, boredom is painful. And we need to do something to ease our boredom. We need something interesting to do, which is why almost nobody's actually going to watch this thing all the way through. We need something entertaining. We need something to keep us stimulated. What happens when you have nothing to do and you're bored? You explore your surroundings, you explore the world, you go on an adventure, you ride a bike, you walk through the woods, you learn to swim, you learn to speak another language, you learn to sculpt, you learn to identify plants, you learn to play a sport, you invent a new sport, all great things. A part of life is escaping boredom, it makes us feel good, but it's not easy, and it shouldn't be. There should be efforts into escaping boredom. And escaping boredom in that process should lead you to better and better things. But what if... This is, that's how humans should naturally be in society. But what if I decided to give you an easy way to ease your boredom? You see, boredom is actually a, a very vital emotion that pushes us to do things with our time and be more productive. But what if I can make you feel productive without actually being productive? Well, you would probably use my method to ease your boredom and get nothing done and achieve nothing meaningful with your life and you'd get addicted to it. And I would earn a whole lot of money because I can sell you this product that takes the boredom away. In a, in a dystopian world, this is what happens. In a, in a natural world, with no technology, if you somehow managed to chase the boredom away, it meant you were doing something good. It meant you were exploring and, and learning something. But the brain does not know the difference between thoughts and experiences. What if I were to trick the brain into not being bored, but instead of getting those benefits from nature like you would be without technology, how about now you just get nothing? And instead, you become even more mentally weak. So that way, you, you come back to my uh, solution to stop the boredom even more. Because you get even bored even faster. It's like, imagine if, um, imagine if somebody made a, a, a chapstick for your lips, but it only made it temporarily smoother. And in the long term, the chapstick actually had some chemical in it that made your lips even more chapped. And you started taking it. Eventually, if you had any sense, you would stop taking it. But if you didn't know any better, 
and you get addicted to it, and you go, I have to keep it as as a uh, as um uh smooth as possible. You would just keep taking it, not realizing it's doing long term damage. If I can offer you this technology that does more long term damage to you and makes you come back to my technology even more and more and more, and continues to do even more long term damage to you, and I can make you addicted to it by easing your boredom, then I stand to make a lot of money. Guys, what are the most valuable companies in the world? Do I even need to say it? There's a, there's a saying, it's, it's the day the iPhone came out is the day boredom died. And if you were, you know, in public or at a restaurant or something before the iPhone and it would be awkward or boring... You can't just like put your head in your phone. No, they they don't exist yet. You have to power through it. You have to face the boredom and you have to do something. You have to stimulate yourself. You have to participate. You have to be social. You figure something out. You go somewhere else. You be productive with your time. Now you don't have to do that anymore. And that's a problem. You be bored. You ignore this and you say, I want to achieve greatness. I don't want to run away from boredom. I want to do the things that running away from boredom would have given me if this was a natural world without technology. But it's not that. And so I'm going to treat the world like it is that. And then I'm going to start from square one and be bored and value boredom and, and foster a love for boredom. YouTube is good at easing boredom. Um, it has a very, very high scale. Uh, I think at its peak... However, um, if you look at each social media at their peaks um, for the for the peak viewers, I think Instagram is even better at easing their boredom for their for the audience that is absolutely addicted to it. I think Twitter is even better than Instagram. I think Facebook is, is even better than Twitter, and I think TikTok is the king of them all. When you're when you're tired of other social media, you know you're tired of watching YouTube videos. You go to TikTok. It is so far the most mechanically efficient way to ease your boredom in as little time as possible, and all with such a simple algorithm. Yet, by virtue of this, it's also the most effective way of wasting your time and your life away. And every single person I say that to tells me I'm right. Even if they're avid users of TikTok, they still tell me that they all know that they should have some boredom throughout their day. It's just easier said than done. It's an addiction. So how can you achieve these bits of boredom every day? Because boredom will force your brain to make new connections. It'll actually, it'll literally force you to be creative. You cut the cut off the things in your life that make it easy for you to get rid of boredom. Boredom should be a difficult thing. If you force your brain to do the hard thing, it'll learn to do the hard thing in an easier way. So when you can get rid of boredom easily, no. You shouldn't, you shouldn't have the option to do that. If you want to achieve greatness, that is. You should force your brain to figure out ways to ease boredom without technology. The way it was meant to. The way we were built, you know? That's vague advice, right? You want practical advice? Okay, practical advice. I told you I was going to give you step-by-step. -step. Practical advice? Don't drink alcohol. Don't smoke weed. Don't snort coke and don't pop pills. That's... Like, that's obvious. If you're not drinking alcohol and smoking weed, you're not doing any of the other stuff either, right? You know what I'm saying. Don't go down that. Don't go down that path. Don't spend all your time sitting down in front of a screen or standing in front of a screen or, or just in front of a screen in general. Um, don't use a screen uh, at least two to three hours before bed. Um, don't eat when you're bored. It, when you're bored, force yourself to just be bored and not eat and not find an easy way out. Uh, don't spend any time on... well. Anytime the world has changed. So I would say don't spend all your time on social media. I would say limit yourself. Literally, there's uh, timers that you can put in apps now. Um, you can go on uh, Android or iOS, and you can literally go to like the screen time section in uh, your settings, like parental controls maybe or something. I'm not exactly sure where it is, but it, you'll find it if you look. And you can literally set things. I think... Um, for all, all social media apps, uh, regardless of what they are, regardless of your job or any of that stuff, you should have uh, time limits for it. Um, don't have contacts in your phone that you don't talk to on a regular basis. 
you clear your mind. This is another part of, of having this thing. You clear your mind. You clear the clutter of all these other things that you don't that you're not involved with. Um, don't have apps on your phone that you don't use on a regular basis. If you play a video game on your phone once every month or so, once every week, delete it. It's not worth it. It's not worth your time. It's not worth um, remembering that video game in the back of your mind. That's space in your brain being taken up by something that's useless that can be put towards something more valuable. Um, don't play bad video games, which is at this point, most video games that are made today. Um, and you know what I mean by a bad video game. You guys all know what I'm talking about. Um, don't gamble. It's a big one. It's a huge one. Don't watch porn. <laughs> like, I'm talking complete dopamine detox. These are things that everyone knows. Don't watch porn. Like, that's... Who doesn't know that? Every single person that watches porn, find one of them that says, Yeah, no, I think it's a healthy thing that I watch porn. Nobody's gonna say that. They all know they shouldn't. Um... Delete TikTok as a whole, I think. I think TikTok, the entire app is toxic, is tick toxic. Um, don't use your phone uh, laying on the bed before or after you sleep. Um, you, should, you should be getting a good sleep. Sleep is, everyone t talks about how underrated sleep is. To put it simply, if, you have, if you're ruining your sleep, you're ruining your life, okay? Um, if you do other things on your bed, you shouldn't be doing anything on your bed anyways other than sleeping. Um, and now some people have a lot more self-control so they can deal with this and they can say, okay, I'm going to go to sleep earlier and do all this stuff. But for people who have trouble sleeping, which is most people, you should really um, understand that your body can be conditioned and that like, you know how whenever you enter the bathroom, you automatically feel like you need to use the restroom. That's because your body's conditioned. That when you feel the cold air, when you feel um, that door close, when you hear the door close, when you hear the atmosphere, when your feet uh, uh, step on the tile or whatever it is, right? All of these things tell your body, oh, I'm going to use the restroom now. And over time, you've conditioned your body to think that. So now whenever you step in the bathroom, even if you don't want to, even if you're going in just a brush or shower, you feel like using the restroom if um, you can, you know? So you can condition your body to do the same thing in any situation, including sleeping. If you intentionally um, say, like, a lot of people sit on their bed and work on their laptop. A lot of people lay on their bed after they wake up and, uh, you know, they'll uh, look at their phones. A lot of people lay on their beds to, uh, like, talk to other people on FaceTime. Or um, they, they sit on their bed to think. Or they sit on their bed while they're eating food out of their lap and things like that. Don't do any of that. Don't touch your bed unless it is to sleep. And it, it's going to be very painful at first. You're going to be laying there for hours probably. I know I did. Um, and you're going to be laying there for hours not being able to sleep. And you're going to be like, this sucks. Give it a few weeks. A few weeks is all it takes. That's nothing in the grand scheme of things. Give it a few weeks and eventually your brain will pick up on the pattern. And it'll go, okay, we're on this bed. This feeling that we have right here. We can, we can be pretty sure now that while we're on this feeling, nothing else is going to happen. So we might as well sleep. I mean, we're, we're pretty safe. There's, no, there's nothing else that can happen. So let's go to sleep. And eventually, you will condition your brain to associate the bed with sleep and nothing else. Um, if you choose to not do anything else on the bed. And that will allow you to fall asleep, v not instantly, but very, very quickly. And you know what? In some cases, instantly. Um, depending on how tired you are. But yeah, you don't use your bed for anything else. Even if you just want to rest. Yeah, I, was, I just want to lay down for a little bit, like 30 seconds. You know, I was doing a hard workout. I'll lay down and get, nope. Lay down on the floor. Lay back in your chair. Lay on the couch. Not on your bed. Condition your body to associate your bed with sleep and only sleep. And I think that's a, they did a huge, huge um, practical piece of advice I can give you to get your creativity back it opens up your mind uh and and i don't you don't need me to tell you this you can look for yourself there's a million things backing up um the fact that sleep but good sleep is good for the mind um so yeah don't i also this is a bit of a this is a, a bit of a controversial one but i think don't listen to music while doing boring tasks like studying don't let your mind just run like, 
uh, uh, or not run, let your mind run, but don't let your mind um, be, be dragged along by this other thing so that you don't have to spend time um, confronting the boringness of whatever you're doing. You should be bored. You should make it difficult for yourself. Go through that pain. Um, and I, this, this, is a, this is one that you do at your own discretion because you know what you have to do. Like you all know that what you, what you need to do to improve your life, right? Um, I listen to the music while I'm at the gym. It uh, it keeps my mind off of the fact that uh, I'm I'm in pain. So, I think there is a trade off that you can make. And I think if you're listening to music while doing some boring things, even though even if you may uh, come to the conclusion that it might cause harm, it may not cause that much harm, and you might go like, it's worth the trade off to enjoy some extra music to have a little bit of a, a extra excitement throughout the day um you know a bit of, a bit of catchiness in my head to like dance around a little bit in my mind so I, I totally get it i totally get it use this at your own discretion um everyone i know works out with music and i never tell them anything but i think if you're really going for this if you're if you're going for a full dopamine detox if you're uh if you want to push yourself to the limits work out raw <laughs> don't play music while working out i really think that's um something to consider trying at least I think I'll, 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 I'll do that. Let me make a note of that right now. I actually want to do that right now. I'm, I, when I go to the gym tomorrow, I'm not taking no, I'm not taking no earbuds this time. I'm, I'm about to make a note. Um, uh, okay. Okay, cool. Um, another thing, don't spend all your time watching movies, TV shows. Don't binge TV shows for hours a day. Don't binge at all. Um, TV shows work best, in my opinion, when, uh, watched in segments throughout the week, throughout, you, you let it, um, you let it be a part of your life. And I love TV. I could never tell, uh, I could never be as much of a hypocrite, even though I do think it's good advice. I could never be such a hypocrite to tell somebody else to do something that I'm not doing myself. I would never ask anyone to do that. So watch TV. Sure. Go for it. Right. I, I get it. Um, I probably shouldn't be watching as much TV as I am right now, but it's who I am. And um, I, I, I find a lot of meaning in that. It gives me a lot of enjoyment. And uh, it does keep me distracted, which I don't think is, is good. I don't think that's healthy for me. But it, I also spend a lot of time analyzing the TV that I watch, and I make content about it and all that sort of thing. And I think in general, for me in particular, um, it does more good than harm. So again, do all these things at your own discretion. If, you, if listening to music while doing boring tasks you feel like does more good than harm to you, if you're a musician or whatever, then yeah, that's all up to you. But binging TV, I, I don't think is healthy for anyone. Um, I think if you want to truly enjoy stories, it, like even for yourself, if you truly love TV and you want to enjoy it to its fullest capacity, you spread it out throughout your life. You let it be a part of a chapter of your life so that way you can look back on it and have memories that connect with everything else and you can reinforce that. Um, and you can tell people about it. You can tell people stories about it in the future. Um... I don't think uh, you should watch any reaction content. I think reaction content, for the most part, like Twitch streamers reacting to stuff, is absolute garbage, waste of time. Uh, I don't think you should follow drama, um, like watch keeping up with like Keem Star and, and Scarce and all this stuff. Occasionally, uh, something that might affect you personally, I could totally see, but you would be doing the research on that on your own. I don't think it's necessary at all to follow any of this drama unless you you yourself are getting involved. Don't follow drama of things that are happening that will never affect you in your life. Drama is a good thing. Drama is it's, it's character development. Um, and there should be drama in your life. Um, it keeps life interesting. But don't follow the fucking Kardashians and all this shit, right? Don't follow uh, like, oh, what's going on with I don't know, fucking, uh, the cash me outside girl or whatever. Who gives a shit? Like, 
don't don't look at any of that. Don't waste your time. Don't waste your energy. Don't even let your brain think that that's an okay thing to um, even remember. You're wasting your memory like that. Your memory is limited. Don't spend your memory remembering stupid information like that. And on that note, I also think you should not pay attention to uh, politics. Don't try to like stay on top of politics or understand these like world events happening so far away around you. Uh, a little bit here and there, I think is very important. And it's, it's for a reason. It's because as humans, we take in this information about the world around us. Um, and it's become completely warped now because if you live in a tribe of 150 people and you get a bit of gossip and you hear this person did this bad thing and this, that's actually very useful information. You would need to know that. You would need to know who the traitor is in, in, in the tribe and all that stuff I was going to say among you, but no, I'm not, I'm not going there, but, um, that's actually very useful information, but people, uh, don't realize that this is a part of their biology and they, treat a world of seven coming up on eight billion people as if we're living in a tribe of a hundred people. And they don't realize that you need to act a bit differently in this in this new world and that you can't follow all this all this politics, all these world events, all these tragedies, current news, all this stuff. It's just something I have to work on. I've, I've been working on, so I don't feel like I'm a hypocrite for saying that one. Um, don't consume so many garbage, ironic memes. I've unsubscribed from a lot of meme, like uh, YouTube channels, uh, curators, Instagram pages, all that stuff. Um, and I think that's actually, that goes hand in hand with, don't try to fit in with everyone else online by understanding everyone's inside jokes. Everyone wants to be a part of everything else. Um, but they don't realize that gatekeeping exists for a reason. Um, if you're a part of everyone's inside jokes, if everyone's a part of it, then it's not inside jokes anymore. You should be a part of the jokes of your community. You should be deep within your community, not shallow in everyone's community. Um, don't read too much. This is a big one. Don't read too much. There's there's a such thing as too much learning. There's such a thing as too many online courses, too much, like, uh, I don't think anyone needs a Skillshare, Skillshare subscription because you can literally just ask somebody who has a Skillshare subscription, hey, can you download this one course for me? Give it to me for $5 and that's literally all you need. There is a such thing as too much information uh, input overload. Um, and the more you learn, the more you forget as well. So you should only, you should choose to really only learn the things that you really, really want to learn. Not just anything that might seem useful. Um, that one, that one in particular, I think I really need to get that point across because so many people might think it's wrong to just ignore information that oh you, you should always be learning new things no there is a such thing as abundance of information you'd much rather learn a few quality things and learn it really really well rather than learning a bunch of random things uh surface level just for the sake of learning and without actually knowing any of it well enough to really apply it or uh, teach to others in general in general all the, all the pieces of advice i can give don't do things that make you feel productive or feel good that are shortcuts to do that, you know? No sugary foods. Sugar, sugary foods emulates uh, sugary foods from nature, which if you're finding sugary foods in nature, that means chances are you're eating high energy food that will not poison you. Very good, very um, uh, good job, good, good for you, you know? Congratulations, you did this thing. You deserve to be rewarded. Um, but in the situation that we're in right now, you don't deserve to be rewarded. So yeah, no sugary foods, no sodas, no no neural hijackers. Um, coffee, I think, is actually one of the underrated things. I think people should be drinking coffee. I think coffee is actually a great... I think people shouldn't be drinking coffee every day. I think people uh, build tolerance to coffee way too easily. I think people should be drinking coffee when they, they feel like they really need energy, um, mental or physical. I think people should be drinking coffee like before leg days and stuff like that, you know, instead of a pre-workout. Um, it's been shown that that uh, when you take away the placebo of calling it a pre-workout, coffee does the same thing as pre-workout um, for workouts. So yeah, n none of like do things in moderation. Um, 
no jerking, I already mentioned no porn, but you no know, jerking off, the same thing. Um, no League of Legends, I feel, I feel the need to mention that one twice. Uh, I think that's everything. Stop playing social media, think for you, cut off the things that are, that are fulfilling these basic tasks for your brain, and um, letting your brain think that you're actually doing the task when you're really not, and taking the easy way out. Um, hmm. I think that's everything. Yeah. But see, these things have all the things that I mentioned, and plus, plus more that I can't think of right now, they all have very, very long um, series of connected events that follow. Like cutting porn will um, make it'll force you to, to push yourself to actually attract uh, like girls in real life. It'll uh, likely push people to go to the gym or work out harder and stuff like that. Um, cutting out alcohol will force you, um, even though I think that's a bit of an odd one because from what I've seen, the people who don't drink alcohol are actually the most boring people. But in theory, um, and with my squad, like the people in my very close vicinity, me, uh, my buddy Faze, um, Zoib, Shanor, Raheem, like none of us drink. And these are the funnest guys I know. But other than these very few anecdotal pieces of evidence I have. Everybody else I find who doesn't drink is very boring, so this may actually be the wrong piece of advice, again, at your own discretion. But in theory, alcohol should force you to, uh, you know, go out and, and learn to be more social and learn to take more um, risks in social settings without re relying on a drug to do it for you. Um, cutting out smoking weed will make you less reliant on its effects. And force your brain to be more creative if that's what weed does for you, which I hear that's what it does for a lot of people. Um, remember, all these things are mental. It's like I said earlier, everything there is to know or experience about the universe is already in your head. Shrooms are not some magical substance that actually transport you into another dimension. You can blend up mushrooms pour it on some rocks, and the rocks won't start tripping out. The rocks won't start seeing colors and shit. The shrooms are just instructing our brains. They're just sending a signal to our brain, a chemical that tells our brains, oh yeah, activate that one um, psychedelic protocol. Those protocols are already in our brain, though. You don't actually need shrooms or, or psilocybin in any way to get it. It's already in your head. In fact, you already know how to achieve that, that effect. Guys, the ultimate, the, the ultimate ending to this, what is meditation? Like, really, what is meditation? Think about everything I've been saying about boredom and all this stuff. What, what is the purpose of intentionally sitting there and doing nothing? It's being comfortable, learning, learning, teaching your brain to be comfortable, to, be, to expand its comfort zone, to include a situation where there is no external stimuli. It's like a superpower. You're teaching your brain to live in its own mind, to, to, to tolerate its own thoughts. It's reaching a new level of self-awareness and it's extreme. It's an extreme uh, thing to do in actuality. Everyone's like, oh, everyone should do meditation. Meditation is actually a very, very extreme way to push your mind. You do it enough. And I mean, like you do it excessively and a lot of people do it excessively, depending on how, what you would define excessively as. And you can achieve the same effects as shrooms, ayahuasca, DMT. You can achieve it all in your own head. No need for substances. You can achieve, um, um, what's it called? This whole uh, sensory deprivation, all this stuff. Mind over matter. Meditation is intentional, forced boredom. That's what it is. And that's why everyone advocates for it so much. And when you get really good at meditating, you realize everything you can achieve by doing all these external things, playing video games, um, uh, what's it called? Getting drunk, getting high, gambling, all this stuff. All of these uh, feelings and emotions, like the thrills and stuff that you can achieve um, by doing these things, you can achieve them sober. You can achieve them without it. Like there's literally a there's literally a yoga procedure to make you feel high, like that's literally a thing, without any substances. These things are all in your head, 
Shroom does not transform your eyes and create colors in front of your uh, cones and rods and all that stuff. It doesn't do anything to your retinas. It just tells your brain, oh yeah, that, that, uh, that trippy thing that you can do, yeah, do that thing. And your brain does it all on its own. And look, ugh, what I'm saying is not easy. This is all easier said than done, right? People do a lot of extreme shit. Like they'll go on a, on a trek and they'll eat like a banana a day for like weeks on end and go on like long stretches of like um, no talking vows uh, and like meditate in camps where there's like, uh, where they separate people by gender and they don't even see the other gender and things like that. Um, they put their bodies in very extreme conditions. Not to say that this is um, what I would recommend everyone to do, because I mean I'm I don't I'm just some random fucking twenty one year old I don't know what the hell I'm talking about, but people people do it and that's not trivial. Nobody said this was going to be easy, but it's possible. If it wasn't possible, people wouldn't put in the effort. It was already a difficult thing for humans hundreds and hundreds of thousands of years ago. Even even without technology. But now with all of these easy ways to overstimulate our brain, imagine how much harder it's going to be to actually achieve this sort of thing. And if you do get good at meditation, it makes uh, these experiences that you can um, conjure up on your own much, much more rewarding. Um, but there's a, there's a grueling and painful journey um, that awaits that. But the results are always worth it. Like your your efforts will pay off with this journey. And I know that the the more masculine among us will hear that and they'll go, ooh, a long and arduous journey? Sign me up. And that's why everyone everyone who, who meditates vouches for it. Because meditation is without them actually even realizing it, it's intentional, uninterrupted. Um, you know, you're away from family and friends. You're, away, you're not saying anything. You're not hearing anything. It is pure boredom. You are forcing your mind to be bored so it can, so it can push its threshold for things, so it can push its threshold for what it tolerates um, to a certain point of being in the habits of allowing you to be naturally happy because your brain has to be happy. It'll always find a way um, in the situation that you're in so long as there isn't crazy things going on. It'll look at the situation you're in and it'll find a way to be happy naturally as long as you make it easy for it. And if you allow yourself to be happy with absolutely nothing during meditation, you build that habit, it'll, it'll transcend uh, to the rest of your life. And it'll make you, like, the exact same things that would have made you sad no longer will. You'll be less picky about the food you eat. You'll stop complaining about, like, minor things. Oh, this guy cut me off in traffic. Oh, the temperature is too hot. You'll stop getting angry at things out of your control. Oh, they got my order wrong. Or, okay, I gotta, I gotta do the laundry. Actually, I'll, I'll, I'll leave that there. I'll, I'll go pick up the laundry in a second. But... It'll, it'll, it'll make you stop sweating the small stuff so much. It'll, it'll let you uh, let go of the things that are out of your control and not uh, always feel the need to complain about things even when you know it won't do anything about it. You'll be... People who get really good at meditation, from what I've seen, are in this like perpetual state of stopping to smell the roses and it, it doesn't end for them. Like... It's always like that. And it's not like they get addicted or anything. It, it, that's just how life is. That's the default of life for them. And I think that's how it should be. Like that breeds the ability to think outside the box. But these things like uh, social media and video games, uh, League of Legends. I, I, I feel, have I mentioned League of Legends? I would mention it again. League of Legends. These things trick you into thinking you're doing something that's worth your time. But it's actually not. And if you get good at meditation, you'll be past that, basically. You'll, you'll see through these, these cheap tricks to, to hook you and get your money. So, like, if you decide that 
uh, you want to do something, right? And you want to be creative with it. Like, for, the, for example, the thing I mentioned earlier with my brother. Let's say you decide how you want something to look, like a light fixture or something, right? You want to design something. Maybe if you're not in the habit of being creative, if you don't have that, uh, those, those juices always flowing, maybe spend the first week. You know, you're going to need some time to get in the habit. Maybe spend the first week just trying to draw out ideas for it. And if you can't think of anything, good. That means your brain is acknowledging it can't be creative, and, and after a week goes by and you can't think of anything, you should feel the pain of that. And you should, and that will tell your brain, hey, something's wrong here. We got to make a change internally. And only after you're able to come up with some creative ideas by, by conjuring it from your own mind, only then you should even consider deciding to consult the all-knowing Google Images Overlord. And at this point, that now that you look at what OpenAI is doing um, with uh, generating images, next level shit, truly impressive. But yeah, that's even more dystopian. And that's going to ruin people even more. I'd stay away from that. I'd stay away from all AI science. And that's what I did, by the way. Like, that's literally what I did is I thought about designs for things and instead of going to google images i would just draw them um ultimately i think it was it was the fact that uh see before this i used to watch movies and tv shows every day i was obsessed with stories um i still am but not in the same way but i would literally finish entire shows every week and i made my brain not have to work to come up with stories like, I should have known what I was doing. I love stories so much. I should have known that what I was doing was throwing away my ability to come up with stories. I could have all the stories I want um, and not be able to come up with them for the rest of my life. Or I could restrain myself. I could, I could take it in moderation. I could listen to the stories that people tell me in person and things like that. And I could limit myself knowing, like, we have built-in mechanisms. The brain is absolutely brilliant when it comes to um, understanding the kind of decisions you should make. Not necessarily making decisions, but understanding what they should be. Like if you listen to your brain and, and listen to it fully, it'll tell you, hey, this thing, this, this TV show that you're going to watch and you're going to binge over the next two days and finish the whole thing, uh, watching it for 10 hours a day, you're going to regret it. If you listen to your brain, you'll actually hear that in your mind. You'll, you'll hear... A voice tell you that. Like, don't do it, dude. Don't do it. You hear another part of your brain saying, oh, it'll be so fun. But you'll hear a part of your brain, a wise part of your brain, say, don't do it. And that's what intelligence is. Intelligence is knowing what part of your brain to listen to in what scenario. And sometimes that intelligent, that, that, that part of your brain is like, hey, you've done enough. Take a load off. Relax a little. Maybe, maybe watch a movie or two, you know? And, and that's when it tells you that those movies you watch end up being way better than anything else. You, in, in, in this camp, Aluma, which I, I'll talk about later, I'll talk about it in the next few streams. Um, yeah, we, we cut out all sweets for 21 days. We went out of state. We went to a, a college campus. It was a camp, no technology, no phones, uh, no computers, nothing like that. Um, it was like all sports and and yoga swimming basketball uh football uh dancing all that stuff it was like we were really it was it was a it was, there was a lot of education a lot of paper a lot of drawing um but yeah no tv shows no movies no no news no uh like the nba finals were going on we didn't know who won uh beyonce had a child we only found, found that out afterwards and all the girls were going crazy about it like we didn't get any external stimuli and we didn't get any sweets either we ate food with everyone else in, in like a tribe basically and we said a chant before it and all that stuff it was like it was really really nice and every night we got to eat two oreos and a cup of milk every night and dude by the end of that camp those two oreos tasted better than anything i have ever eaten in my entire life and I know that if I had eaten way more sweets, those Oreos would not have that same impact. And so, 
you, you learn to do things in moderation. You learn to reward yourself properly. That if you really want to experience these things, you should do them in moderation. And uh, you should force your brain to pick up the slack and to do like 99% of the work for you, you know? I think what really did it, what really killed my creativity was all of the stuff that I was watching. And it took me so long after that. Like I had gotten sick of stories. Because, and you know what? I, I thank art school for that. Because art school, like I, I took film classes. I went to film. Uh, I was doing a film major. And they teach you how to analyze film. And after analyzing a bunch of films, dude, it, I hated films after that. Like I hated movies because I would watch a movie and I'd be like, well, the cinematography was like this and they didn't direct the actors right in this scene and they didn't follow the 180 degree rule here. And I would think about all these things and it would ruin movies for me. And so I'd stopped watching everything. And because I had stopped, it took like three years actually for me to actually stop uh, watching everything, movies, TV shows. Like you can ask my family, I don't watch anything with them. They still watch movies, TV shows all the time. I don't watch it with them. It's just them, not me. It used to be all of us. I don't participate anymore. Um, and they still do it all the time. Occasionally they have me with them, very rarely, because they want me to be with them when they watch this stuff. Oh, as a family and all that stuff. I'm like, all right, cool. But I don't pay attention to the movies. Um, and only now, only now I'm starting to... Uh, come to terms with it and starting to go like, hey, maybe I can watch a few things here and there. Like, maybe I can watch, like, uh, I don't know, Better Call Saul and things like that, you know? Maybe maybe I can watch these pieces of media that I've wanted to watch for so many years. Game of Thrones, uh, Fight Club, you know, all these things like that. Maybe uh, I can spread it out throughout my time. And uh, instead of watching whatever new thing comes out every week, I can take the 100 most... Um, most beloved, like, greatest works of uh, film of all time, uh, 100 best movies, 100 best TV shows, and I could say, I'm going to watch one of these a month. I'm going to watch one movie a month. And I, I indulge for those two, three hours, and then for the rest of the month, all the stories that I, have to, I get to experience have to come from my own mind, or uh, maybe a book or two here and there, you know? Which is, that's something i got to work on, because I could hardly read. But yeah, it's, it's, it's been a real journey for me and it's taught me a lot. And I'm not in that like, when, in 2019, when I was going through all this, the dam broke and it was just too much for me to handle. I'm not, I'm not in that same like dream state anymore that I was back then. It was like, in 2019, I was a slave to the ideas. And now it's more like I'm a partner to the ideas. Like I've incorporated my creativity into my will. And now I'm pretty damn creative compared to what I used to be. But it's still nothing compared to what happened in 2019. And even though that might seem like 2019 was a good year, it, it's, it's not the way you'd want to live your life. It's, it's a hellish kind of addiction. It was, it was relentless. Relentless. That is the only way I could word it. But... It didn't even feel like my ideas. I feel kind of bad. Like, it felt like some other being, some higher power or whatever, was sending ideas into my head, funneling them all into me so I can make them a reality. That's what it felt like. I feel, like, guilty, honestly. Because these ideas were, are worth millions. And sometimes I feel like they aren't even my ideas. Like, they didn't even come from my mind. Like, they're not, they're not mine to do anything with. They're not... The money that I would earn from them, it doesn't belong to me. They were just put in my mind. Also, damn, I, I'm, I'm talking way too much. I gotta, I gotta speed this up. Okay, the last thing I did, limiting myself, all right? This one is actually a very well-known method for learning to become more creative. If you, let's say you have to train for a fight, right? You don't just spar 24-7 and do nothing else. On the surface, it may seem like that is the most efficient way to spend your time, right? That's the right way to go. But in reality, you're missing out on a lot of the focused parts of the discipline, like um, drills being the main one. But honestly, I could go even further than this. Limitations breed novelty. 
And this actually goes hand in hand with boredom, but I'm separating them out. Um, so if you're getting ready to fight, okay, and you know, okay, one of the aspects of fighting is having balance, being able to balance and shift my weight around. Maybe one of the things you can learn to do is um, learning to walk on a tightrope, developing that skill. Because when you're on the canvas, it's not easy to balance when you're in there and someone's trying to trying to predict your movements. Because, like, you, you, you aren't limited in your training. And if you really want to change the way your brain works, you want to condition your brain, this all comes down to conditioning. The, the boredom and the acting without thinking um, and limitations, it all comes down to conditioning. I'm just giving you methods on how to condition your brain. And these, this kind of conditioning will train the, the neural pathways in your brain. GSP, for example, he's considered the greatest UFC fighter of all time by most UFC fans. He does gymnastics. Um, Anderson Silva, the most terrifying and captivating fighter to ever do it who still to this day holds the record for most consecutive UFC wins, he does ballet. Like he literally, he does these things to form these neural um, novel connections in his mind. Israel Adesanya, the greatest middleweight fighter on planet Earth today, does breakdancing. And that also, why, that also explains why his defense looks so good. Uh, not necessarily like flawless, but like it looks so captivating. Because he catches the rhythm of his opponent and he, he keeps playing that rhythm in his head the same way a dancer would catch the rhythm of the beat and, and they'd keep their body moving at the same BPM. Like, um, did you guys watch when um, Israel, Adesanya was jo Israel Adesanya was on Joe Rogan? I showed a clip from that earlier. But um, there was actually another clip from that same podcast where he was talking about how he had dealt with imposter syndrome. And it's like, Bro, that's exactly what this is. Like, a fucking course, right? Anyone who starts to improve rapidly and reach higher levels in their discipline is going to feel like an imposter. And imposter is such a negative word. Like, people don't ever stop to think, like, hey, maybe this is what you want. Maybe imposter syndrome, this, like, feeling that you get is actually, is not a bad thing. Maybe it's telling you something. Maybe it means there, that there's an opportunity here for, like, a blank slate to absorb information like a sponge. Ignorance and imposter, they're such bad words, but with negative connotation. But in reality, if you know you're an imposter, if you feel that, not, not if you are an imposter, but if you know you're one, and you know your ignorance, if you know you're a student of the game and you bow your head to the great masters who came before you, it lets you go down a path of incredible mental exploration and ad adventure. You know, when I took Film 100 in college, for the first few times we got to use cameras, we wouldn't um, move it. We wouldn't be allowed to move it. Like, we get a tripod, he showed us how to use a tripod, and he said, okay, when he set up the camera, once it's all set, you have to record and then uh, stop recording and record, stop recording and record all your scenes from that single angle, and you're not allowed to move it in any way, tripod or camera. And I realized the value of this immediately. And I even made it a rule for myself even after that class. For like the next like 10 months of my life, every single video I would make, I would set up the camera and never move it from beginning to end. If I record a video halfway through and, and realized like, oh, this dude can't walk in from this angle, his head's going to be cut off at this door frame. Um, I, if Before this, I would be like, all right, let's just do a second take and uh, I'll move the camera. I'll point the camera upwards. Nope, can't do that. Got to start over. I have to punish myself. In, in school, that's what we had to do, basically. We would, we would literally have to, have to punish ourselves for not taking it into account before we started. And that way, our brains would go like, hey, why do we feel this pain? Let's piece things together. Let, let's look at what's going on here and, um, and try to find some patterns to, so, so that we can prevent this from happening from next, next time. We would literally be incentivized to think about every possible scenario beforehand, to develop um, what you would call a cinematographer's foresight, which is not something, it's not easy to develop. 
and uh, even other film most other filmmakers don't have it to 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 the highest level like we were really forced to consider it was tough dude we were forced to consider uh like the framing there was no more like um oh i'll just fix it in post no if we want to be time efficient if we want to get out of this blistering heat or we want to like sit down and rest our legs if we want to like finish the project before the due date or before the party tonight and all this stuff we have to get everything right on our first we have to get it right with one angle and that makes our brains panic it overclocks our brains uh into being more aware of everything and we're like we have to get a good grade there's no choice right and we really want to go to this party so we can't take that much time so we can't do reshoots it'll take too long we might as well spend the time now considering everything right and do everything right the first time rather than doing it over and over again and doing reshoots so consider everything before hitting record you consider the placement of the camera uh the framing the composition the leading lines the angles the um protrusions the temperature the white balance the depth of field uh, by the way we weren't allowed to change the white balance and, and color temperature all that we weren't allowed to do any of that we have to consider um the dynamic range uh of the lights and the shadows um whether or not there's going to be enough light in this uh corner of the room so that it won't get um it won't get muddied or whether or not the sunlight is blowing out this part of the sky and we would have to consider character movement and balance and repetition and the 180 degree rule and how you're going to plug in power to your camera with thin cords uh, the short cords um how you're going to make sure everything can stay in focus uh how you're going to make sure the microphone isn't in the frame um how you're going to make sure all the lights are actually pointed at the scene and that shadows of the sticks of lights won't end up in the scene and, and how they can all get uh, electrical outlet access and how they won't be drawing too much power from the same source as another outlet and they won't die halfway through you have to consider all of this stuff and only after you thought of absolutely everything only then can you shoot and even then you'll mess something up which is why we never got hundreds on any of our assignments cuz something will always happen that's 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 film 101 something's going to go wrong and that means there's always something to learn which is a beautiful beautiful thing in my opinion that something always goes wrong i i love that you just you just don't know what's going to go wrong until it does and i think the knowledge of that like even if you think you're you're every you've thought of everything eventually after doing it enough times you realize oh yeah no this art form goes far beyond the capabilities of of where i'm at right now i'm in this ignorant stage and once you finally get it right and you finally complete the video so that you can take it take out the sd card hop in the editing room there's this like everyone's high-fiving and stuff scenes done there's this immense immense euphoria it's unmatched and now because of this i built such an insane skill like people don't even know this is a skill um cinematographer's foresight they don't know about this like i look at i realized first of all i realized how much of an amateur i was before that class and i also realized how much of an amateur i still am um i realized how long of a way i have to go if i want to reach the heights of this industry and i even look at other people in the industry and i realize how much of an amateur they are most of these people who like make these music videos for rappers and stuff they're pathetic like these guys shoot videos so effortlessly they they shoot a whole music video in one day they don't even prank they don't even think about what they're shooting rappers nowadays have such a low standard for the music video directors they use like they do fine right they do okay um but they could do so much better and now if you want a music video from someone the standard is so low you can literally pay them like 100 bucks um and and get like a okay video because of the technology but that's not art there's nothing artistic about that but if you want one from me i do music videos for a different reason i don't do music videos for for uh just to get it out of the way so i can get my 100 bucks i do music videos for the art of it if you want to hire me for a music video it's a $1500 uh non-refundable retainer to me 
Um, and that's just so we can talk about the video and brainstorm ideas and hop on some calls and meet up in person and all this stuff. That's just to retain me and it's non-refundable. So after we brainstorm and if I determine, um, oh no, we're not compatible, my ideas won't be able to work with you, I can leave with that $1,500. I've never actually ended up doing it. I always ended up making a music video for them. There was one instance where they said no and they wanted the money back and I told them no. I told them I'd shoot the video for them if they wanted, but they said no because my vision was not compatible with theirs. AKA, I actually wanted them to do a lot more work than they were willing to do. That's really what it was. They were too busy uh, spending every night smoking in the studio and they didn't... Um, this was before my retainer was 1500 My retainer was a lot smaller at the time. My retainer was $200. But um, if it was 1500 at the time, he definitely would have still shot with me. He wouldn't want to lose that money. But yeah, he was like, all right, I'll just cut my losses here. I'm not about to you know, do a, a, a six-day shoot, which is what I had proposed. He's like, I'm not about to do a six-day shoot to get the vision that I want. And I, I'm, I'm very flexible. I'm like, whatever vision you want, I'm, I'm cool with that. Um, but I know my value. I know my value. Like, it, first of all, it's a thousand five hundred retainer, uh, non-refundable, and then it's one hundred dollars an hour when filming and fifty dollars an hour when editing. Because I bring that value, and you might not think I bring the value. Some for a lot of people, I don't bring that value to you because the money is worth a lot more to you than a video from me. But to a lot of other people, I know I bring that value. If you put me in a room, I've developed that foresight now, that cinematographer's foresight, the intuition. Naturally, it's effortless for me. That without even really thinking about it, I can tell you in a second the best place to put the lights, the key lights, the fill light, the backlight, uh, the camera, tripod. I'll literally, I bring the apple boxes, I put them up, I, I bring the crew, I know where to put the sandbags, I know where to put the microphone and the reflectors and the jelly filters. I bring the speakers to record music videos in particular, even though most of the time I, I'm recording is not music videos. I bring I bring a generator. I bring the actors and the models and the green screen. I um, I handle the camera settings, uh, lens size, focal length. I use this to pay for more equipment. Just by, just by looking at a room, I could tell you everything that needs to be done to get the kind of shot you'd want to get. I can tell you all of this stuff in the blink of an eye too, because I train myself like that. I put myself in those limited scenarios. Like there was this other example, um, this dude I know, he sucked at chess. He was playing at like a 300 level. So in order to get better, he was. I was telling him like, bro, uh, I found this site where it lets you play with only knights and knights are the most fucking confusing piece, right? I told him, I'm like, if you can play with knights only, you can get better at all the other pieces. You can understand how these pieces interact with each other. So I put the limitation on him. And he played for about a day. And from the beginning of the day, he was a 300. By the end of the day, he was an 800. And he got bored and he stopped. Um, but if he really wanted to get good at chess, like he could have continued and gotten significantly better with different strategies like that. Like what I would, I would, I would train him. I, I could literally train him, even though I'm probably not even 800 in chess. I could literally probably train him because I understand how to be creative and how to learn. And this applies to all kinds of learning. It applies to everything, whether it be learning how to play chess or learning a language. I know the most efficient way to do all of it, not most efficient. It'd be naive of me to say it's the most efficient, but I know a very, very efficient way to get it done. And it, like with chess, if you want to get good at chess, um, you could change the game to train your mind. You know, you could play with all bishops and then you'd play with all pawns in the next game. And then you could play looking at the board upside down or sideways. So that way you could see how your opponent sees or you could see from a new perspective. And you could try to guess the best moves from their eyes. Um, you could play with requirements like, um, oh, you have to win by peace sacrifice. You know how back in the day people would be like, okay, if I'm going to get the final kill cam, it has to be 360 no scope. Yeah, you put these you put these contingencies on yourself. Like if you don't sacrifice a piece to win, then it doesn't count. 
and you punish yourself for not sacrificing a piece to win. And you incentivize, you eat a eat an M and M every time you win by peace sacrifice. You incentivize yourself, things like that. I'm sure he can go even higher, and I'm sure if I choose to get good at chess, I can get pretty pretty damn decent at chess. Um, I could do things like uh, play uh, with pieces in random spots to really understand how the pieces work. So that way, any opening uh, theory won't won't work on me, and uh, we won't be able to apply any of the opening principles. We'll just have to play as best as we can with our understanding of the pieces, which will particularly help in the middle game, um, because we're already in middle game. There is no opening. I could uh, I could play with restrictions like oh every other move has to be a pawn move. I could play blindfolded. I could play. Um, bullet chess and then immediately afterward i play classical chess and then i go back to bullet chess i can play shogi which is a different it's that japanese um it's a japanese thing i can make a uh, a condition for myself where the first three moves that i make has to be completely random so i can abandon uh opening theory for myself and let the other person use opening theory so that way they get a little advantage from the start and i know these things would work. I know they'd make me better. I know highly efficient ways to learn pretty much everything now. I know how to, uh, if I wanted to get good at an FPS game, if I wanted to learn how to trade, if I want, like, no matter what I wanted to learn how to do, I know how to do it. I would limit myself. I would put limitations on myself. That's how. That's what lets you develop perspective. Almost everyone I talk with in academia just reads what other people do they aren't leaders they don't do their own shit they just read a lot they're readers not leaders and these people who are like scholars apparently they just do a lot of information input and because they have no originality no discoveries no contributions like they never come up with any anything profound on their own they just consume information and that makes it more and more difficult for them to come up with more profound thoughts. Like, I never read any papers on music theory. I just looked at my own patterns of what I saw people did in the studio, and I developed my own music theory. Like, I have my own vocab um, for musical, uh, um, theoretical things. And I've even developed a couple uh, concepts that I've... I haven't really heard or seen before talked about in any musical discussion. Uh, to be fair, I don't look at much musical discussion, but I think the things I thought about might be original, possibly. And by original, I, I literally mean the things I've thought about. I might be the first person to have thought about them. And you can kind of see how I'm tying it all back now into ignorance. This is why I say ignorance and not acting without thinking. Because to the smart cookies out there, ignorance implies action. Like if I'm if I'm ignorant on a political subject, right? If somebody calls me ignorant on something, that not only means that I don't know anything about it, that means I'm also trying to speak on it. Like nobody will call you ignorant on something that you don't ever speak on or, or, or debate about, you know? Everyone is ignorant on 99% of all of the information out there that there is to know. But you don't call everyone ignorant all the time. You don't blame babies for being ignorant about, you know, not knowing seven times four or whatever. Like, but in reality, everyone is ignorant about everything with very, very few exceptions. They just don't speak on it. And it's like, okay, I'm, I'm ignorant in botany, right? I don't know anything about botany. But nobody ever called me that. Nobody ever said, wow, you're so ignorant in the subject. Because I don't do it. I don't participate. If I were someone who was like, oh, I know about this political thing and this thing and it should be like this. And they'd be like, you're ignorant. That's because I don't know anything and I'm trying to participate. So ignorance, um, as, a, as a colloquial definition, as used today, implies action. It implies that I would be out here uh, you know, talking about, uh, plants and their genetics and their, uh, biology and all that stuff without knowing anything about botany. And I'll be trying to speak on it or I'll be trying to do something about it. I'll be trying to, um, explore with it, you know, but simply not knowing anything 
doesn't uh, imply ignorance um, on like a on like a grander scale. It's like technically ignorance, but nobody would ever say that. Um, so for the smart people, for all the smart cookies out there, I I use the word ignorance. I say ignorance is going to help you be creative. But for the not so smart people who need me to connect the dots, who don't like think about it this way, I say acting without thinking. And nothing wrong with not being able to connect the dots. I'm not that smart either. I just think a lot. I'm not like I'm not like fast or witty, you know. I can't win debates like that. I need time. I can win debates, but only if you give me a week to make a YouTube response. So don't think I'm bashing anyone. Everyone has strengths and weaknesses. Everyone has different ways of learning. Smart people and stupid people are, are one and the same. The word stupid is actually just a placeholder term um, for someone who is smart in something else. So when I call someone stupid, I mean they're smart in something else. And that was actually um, my dad's advice. Not, not the smart and stupid thing, but earlier, my dad told me... Uh, this sort of, like how to be creative in like a bunch of different ways. He would tell me like, oh, people have this misconception as to how life works. Um, people know how to do step one and step two and step three, but nobody connects the dots uh, that the first hundred steps before step one and two and three are all uh, failure steps that you're supposed to fail. And that if you aren't willing to go in knowing you will 100% fail, basically he said, if you aren't willing to go in um, understanding that you are ignorant, then you'll never even get to step one. And everyone will, will think, of the, will, they'll consider step one and two and three, but they'll never consider the negative steps. They'll never consider the steps before that, which are all steps of ignorance and you getting yourself up to speed. And he told me, he's like, be willing to be a fool from the very start because that's the only choice you have. You either be a fool from the start of your discipline or you don't start. And he also told me, he literally said that. It was, my dad was a very, very wise person sometimes. He also told me that, uh, like school, school teaches people specifically uh, how to think before they act, right? As they grow older, they enforce the idea, think before you act. But by age 16, my dad said age 16. I don't know about that. That was just my dad's interpretation. But he said, um... By at the latest, age 16, that's about the right age for you to start doing without thinking. And then see how, how long the fun can last, basically. He told me that when I was 16, so um, that was my dad's advice. And it was, it was, it was fun. It was fun. Um, when I started taking that advice, um, when I was 16, 16 and 17 and 18... And over time, I, I built up these habits of acting without thinking, basically. Uh, and I, I knew my limits, so I didn't, I didn't take it so far. But um, I think that's how I beat writer's block. Actually, I'm, I'm pretty sure. I'm sure I'm, I can confidently say that's how I beat it. I write, by the way, I don't know if I mentioned that. I'm not using writer's block as like an analogy. I actually write. And um, my writing doesn't seem to really follow any rules from the occasional YouTube video I see on writing principles. It has a pretty high percentage of original content. I'd say it's about 10% right about now. And um, I can't even read, which is really funny. I'm borderline illiterate. I can, I can read in a couple other languages almost as good as I can read in English. And I never learned any other languages. I just, I just read English so bad. But... Yeah, even though I can read at like a close to a kindergarten level, I write like 4,000 words a day. Um, and on my best days, when I was 19, oh, best, uh, on my most fever dream-like days when I was 19, I really wasn't even in control. Some days throughout the year, I would write 25,000 words. I, mean, I think I spoke 25,000 words in this stream. Dude, my throat hurts. But... And, and on my best day ever, I literally count it, my best day ever, I wrote 40,000 words in a day. And if you really look at the world and you, you look at the most creative people and you just look at what they do, 
you'll you'll see the patterns like creativity these things might seem counterintuitive like ignorance boredom and limiting yourself these these are very very counterintuitive on first glance but thinking counterintuitive is the same thing as thinking in novel ways it's the same thing as thinking in ways that other people are not thinking and you see one of the struggles that is that if you just try to think of something novel without already being in the habit of creative uh, of, of being creative you think of stuff so novel that it doesn't apply but you need to do you need to be able to say stupid things and think stupid things in order to uh, build your way up to saying smarter th- slightly smarter things right like it, let's say you you want to come up with a solution to a problem and you you're just acting without thinking all right uh how can we create a uh a better water bottle okay um pineapple okay well that's novel for sure right but it's so novel that it makes no sense well guess what i took a shot and that's better than nothing all right most people would think that's stupid and stop i think that's stupid and i go okay from pineapple uh i can start to reel it in um pineapples store water in sponge like fibers edible fibers maybe you can do this maybe um get fiber and water together in an edible fashion and use this to reduce plastic waste so that way nobody has to throw any of the, anything away the packaging is edible you can create like large boxes like packed to the brim with these like condensed fibers soaked in water um like jello like fibers maybe even just jello um and then you can ship them in bulk to places where they can like take it and like the people in 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 those places like africa or whatever they can like cut out pieces of these fibers and like serve them to people and you know when you're transporting something as valuable as water um transporting it with the convenience of of uh of like transporting food that makes things a little easier actually this could actually be a great idea they can they might be able to last a little longer you can you can prevent water from water from rotting like that maybe in some cases depending on the fibers maybe you can hold larger pieces in your hand you know unlike liquid water you can't just like pat, it's very difficult to transport it and boom there's something in, there's a way for people to take water home without needing to carry around these bottles everywhere and, and create all this plastic waste where there is no landfills in there in the in the tribes in Africa and they could just eat the the packaging basically see see how i just thought of that just now it's a stupid idea i know um if i was 19 i probably would have spun into like some actual solution to solve global water shortages um actually that remember when um not remember when but remember when we were taught in school maybe not everyone was but i learned about greek mythology um i think that was not part of the curriculum i think my teacher was just teaching us that i think he was just really passionate about it and we learned about um uh there was one day where it was athena and um poseidon and they went to the humans and the humans were like uh they were like bragging they were like i'm the better god no i'm the better god i'm dirty dan and so they were like i can offer the humans what they want more than you can and poseidon in his arrogance apparently um you know he's the god of water so he you know opened up a well or something and created an infinite source of water and that he's the god of what that's all he can do though and everyone was like oh great that's w- water that's amazing thank you so much Poseidon we owe it all to you and then Athena who is who like her mascot is like the fucking um no her mascot's the owl or something like that but like her a representation of her is like olive trees and stuff like that she created an olive tree and not only did the olive tree have it was like an unlimited these like, goddess god and goddess stories so the olive tree not only gave them a source of of 
water and the nutrition of the of the plants that it grew and of the flora that it grew. It also gave them olives, which is a great source of nutrition, and it gave them oil from the olives. And it gave them a tree so the kids can like run up the tree and uh, climb on the branches and do all that stuff. And uh, people can, you know, as the tree grows, they can cut down the branches and use it to make houses. It was like, that ended up being way more useful. And if you follow the philosophy of like, um, don't give a man a fish, you teach him how to fish. Bro, my answer pineapple just now is actually a pretty damn good answer. You want to, um, you want to give these people a, a good source of water, bro. All you got to do is take a, a camp of kids, tell the kids, Hey, look on the internet. Cause you have this godlike, uh, you know, infinite wisdom resource here. And we're going to go there. And you can do all your research. We're going to go there. We're going to educate a bunch of people in these tribes who, at this point, this is already happening. There's not much education left that you can give to people anymore. But we're going to educate these people in these tribes. Um, we're going to bring a bunch of seeds um, for non-invasive plants, plants with predators, uh, you know, bananas, apples, oranges, uh, like that sort of kiwis, all that sort of thing. You, we're going to bring all these plants over there. And we're going to teach them how to grow and harvest these plants. And you're going to educate them. And bro, these, these fruits and vegetables that you give them hydrate. Like it's, it's hydrating to eat them. So you could effectively solve a major, major part of the um, irrigation problem with simply by responding with the word pineapple. Because pineapples hydrate you. So, yeah, it's not even just better than nothing. It's significantly better than nothing. Act without thinking. Give random answers for things. And uh, at least that's better than no answer. At least try your hand at these things, right? The way I, the way I describe it with, with ignorance is I tell people, I usually teach this to kids. Um, I tell adults, I think like kids. But, um... I tell kids, think like an idiot. You know, all the whole world will tell you, oh, you shouldn't do that, you shouldn't do that. The whole world snuffs the, the creativity out of kids nowadays. They tell kids, oh, you shouldn't play with this thing, you shouldn't... Bro, but kids are creative by nature. They're morbidly curious by nature. And kids say a lot of dumb shit, but kids are not dumb. We just call that dumb shit. They say whatever's on their mind. You have no idea. People people my age who don't interact with kids nowadays, they have no idea how like racist and sexist and fat phobic kids are. Because kids are just, they're just honest. That's all they are. And they just say whatever's on their mind. Doesn't matter how right or wrong it is. If they're thinking it, they say it. Um, if they've lived for, you know, seven years seeing only black people their entire lives and they see a kid with white skin, they're going to walk up and be like, Yo, why is your skin white? In reality, there's nothing wrong with that, you know? But social norms and the triggered mob need something to be angry at to justify their existence so they choose to be offended at stuff like this. But yeah, you don't, don't be afraid to say stupid shit. Don't be afraid to offend people. To, to offend is to think. Don't be afraid to, like, literally be called evil. You want to know one of the most creative ideas I've ever heard this is what I mean when I say creativity is counterintuitive. Being creative does not feel the way that like you would think creative creative creativity feels like. It feels like frustration. That's what it feels like. It ends up being creativity, but it feels like frustration. You have to think counterintuitively. This is one of the most creative ideas I've ever heard. It was animal conservation companies. Let's say you run one of these companies and you need to protect... Um, I don't know, let's say like the black rhino population, okay? Let's say there's like 200 black rhinos alive in the world right now. I don't even think there are that many. But um, I think it's like sub 50 at this point or something. But let's say hypothetically, um, you want to protect black rhinos and you need funds, okay? To prevent poaching, put in security, all that stuff. You need a lot of money uh, to monitor the species. So where do you get that money? So you, you think, think, think. People watching this, think, think with portals. I mean, uh, think with limitations, people. Think 
counterintuitively. Think in the pers- in the in in the mind of someone who people would call evil. I know you can do it. I I like if you think enough, you pause it, pause it, and think of some solution. That's right. Kill the rhinos, or more specifically, kill a rhino. Oh man, animal lovers are not gonna like this one, but I'm being serious. As someone who has a bit of money now and who loves meat and loves the game of hunting and loves experiencing the rare things in life in the future for sure me personally i'd be looking for some opportunities to to hunt and eat exotic animals animals that no other human on earth gets to eat nobody's going to eat a black rhino there's only a handful of people that get to do that endangered species no way and In the future, I mean, I don't have this kind of money, but in the future, I would totally pay like a hundred thousand dollars, you know, if anyone has a, as a blue lobster, you know, I'll, I'll pay, I'll pay like a million dollars for someone, uh, if someone has some, some like super rare, like albino alligator meat or something like that, you know, and boom, that's where you get your funds. Say you have, uh, three new rhino being born each year. Well, you can, technically, you can kill off two of them and you'll be fine. You won't. Uh, that's excessive. But you can kill off two of them and you'll be fine. Actually, you can kill off all three and, and let one survive every other year. Uh, maybe every three years, you know? And the population numbers would still grow. But as long as a species is growing, you can kill off certain members of a species, um, even if they're endangered. I'm not saying you can as in, like, legally you can. I'm saying morally you can to protect the species. Because you'd rather a species grow slowly than not grow at all, than go extinct due to poaching. And, um, like, you would never go that far. You would never kill two out of three rhinos. That's a little much because you want, you don't, you not only want growth, you want, uh, fast growths, you'd find a balance. You'd want all three rhinos to live. You'd, you'd want the black rhinos po- population to be out of the endangered species list, um, you know, by a, by a much greater factor if you can, you know. So you want some cushion room because some black rhinos are just going to die no matter what. But you don't actually have to kill any of those rhinos that are born. The baby rhinos, you don't kill any of them. You kill an old rhino that's already passed on its genes, that's infertile. Um, because another animal is gonna kill it. Like that's a cycle of life. Another animal, a group of animals, a pack of animals, they're going to kill that rhino. It's going to be their dinner. And as another animal myself, as someone who wants to experience what my body's capable of, as someone who wants to be one with nature, I would love to be the animal that kills it just as humans used to you don't you don't cancel a jaguar for eating a deer like i mentioned earlier so you you shouldn't cancel a human for doing the same thing we are animals we should be one with nature trying to defy that is foolish it's 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 the future but it's foolish you kill them because you love nature and just as you eat the nutrients of the animal when they die when you die, your nutrients go right back into nature, and that's a cycle of life. Now think about it for a second. What kind of a fucking maniac comes up with the idea to... to Like imagine Maya Higa for a second, okay? What possible train of thought could she ever take, creative or not? What, how could she ever come up with the idea in her head, like on her own, like, hmm... How can we save the animals? Uh, let's see, spitballing here. How about we auction off uh, options to hunt and kill them? Maya would never uh, let that thought enter her head. Like what, what maniac psychopath comes up with an idea like that? No idea, whoever it is though, I fucking look up to that guy. They got, they got a, as Kanye said, name one genius that ain't crazy. I would, I would pay a million to, um, to hunt and kill a black rhino, considering how rare they are and uh, 
wondering how uh, incredible that meat would taste, how, how exotic and how novel it would taste. Actually, probably more. Um, not now, obviously. But in the future, if, if I have that kind of money, I would totally do it. And I can't eat all that meat myself. I would take the horn. I would turn the nails into um, rings and bracelets and cufflinks, and I would sell them at an exorbitant price. I'd make all my money back. I would, uh, I would take the skin of the black rhino, and I'd make custom limited edition clothes and sell them for $1,000 a piece as part of uh, the Apex Predator Gucci collection. You know, I'd partner with uh, some, some brand, and I'd be like, here's the Apex Predator collection, uh, season season one of one um, of, of black rhino skinned uh, purses and, and shoes, Nike shit, like that sort of thing. You know, I just thought of this just now. Um, I, like I said, I do have a bit of creativity still left in me. I would take half the meat um, because there's a lot of meat. There's no way I could finish it. I take half the meat and I give it for free, actually, just to Michelin star chefs all over the world. And I tell them like, hey, I'm going to sponsor you and, and be like limited to actually I'd pay them. I'd pay them. I'd be like, add this to your menu where they go to their restaurant and they'd be like, hey, everyone, limited time uh, menu item, ultra rare black rhino. Um, for some restaurants, if they're not as like well renowned, but they're still good, I'd be like, sell it for like $600 for a 10 ounce. And you're crazy if you think people won't pay that because People want to experience these things. They want to eat meat that, that no other human gets to eat. They pay a lot. I pay a lot. And then I'd go to other Michelin star chefs who are like very well known. And I'd be like, okay, I'm going to sponsor you. I want you to shout out my companies. I want you to uh, say that this is brought to you by my company, all this stuff. And, and I'd try to make my money back. And I'd say, give it for free. Make this this meat for people and, and give it for free. Cook it as best as you can. And at that point, when you look at it that way, a million dollars is actually is a is a small sum to pay. I'd probably pay more. But if you ask Maya, like first of all, the animal that I would have killed would I'd be there there'd be no harm I'd be doing to the species by killing it. But if I were to tell Maya about this, she would be distraught at what I was saying until I brought up the million dollars, of course. Because she knows just how much a million dollars, uh, how much of a difference that makes in animal conservation. This ain't no, animal conservation is different, bro. M money hits different in animal conservation. This is not no uh, AAA game development where like a million dollars will get you a fucking like flappy bird or something like that, right? No, a million dollars is a big deal in animal conservation. It's like, it's like Honda horsepower, 260 horsepower out of a out of a 90 Civic, will feel way stronger than a, than 700 horsepower out of a Mustang, all right? It's it's money in, just like how horsepower hits a different in uh, Hondas and NSXs and, and things like that, and Miatas, money hits different in uh, conservation. And there's so many millionaires and billionaires in the world today who want these like incredible once-in-a-lifetime experiences Considering all the dumb shit that they buy, uh, you know, all these people buy so much jewelry. Cardi B has like millions of dollars worth of cars she can't even drive. Millionaires spend their money just randomly. Just They don't even know what cool options are out there. If you present this option to them, the, the, op the auction bids would be staggering for these kinds of things. It would be tremendous. It would, it would like usher in a, in a renaissance of animal conservation. It's a good idea. And they do this a little, little tiny bit, by the way. Um, I think there was this instance where they were, there was like this giraffe that got some disease and uh, it was like old, it was super old and it was going around killing other baby giraffes. It was a threat to its own population. It was like jealous of the younger ones in the population. Sound familiar, right? But it was like going around literally killing other giraffes. So this giraffe had to be killed to protect the species. So they auctioned it off. And the highest bidder paid like hundreds of thousands of dollars for the option to like go out with its buddies, uh, take a bunch of jeeps, you know, dune buggies, go out into the um, into the uh, forest or whatever. Uh, not forest. Go out into. Well, it was kind of like the desert, from what I remember. 
but I don't think they like live in like the desert like that. Um, but you know what I mean. Go into the wilderness, and they'd have security and all that stuff, and they would hunt and kill that particular one. Like the people would um, go and like they tag it, and like they could have killed the giraffe, right? But they wanted to make some money so that they can use it to f to further their animal conservation efforts. So they're like, we could kill this giraffe. We can tag it right now. We could kill it, but instead we're going to tag it, put a mark on it, blue mark on it, whatever. So that way they know which giraffe to kill. And we can make a lot of money off of it. And the, the dude went and he, he saw this once in a lifetime opportunity to eat giraffe meat. And he did. He hunted that giraffe, killed only that giraffe, saved so many different... Um, saved many of the of the giraffes of its own species and a lot of money went to animal conservation everyone wins except maya she loses but everybody else wins and what's more is that the conservation mindset is so unlikely to ever produce a train of thought that would ever allow for the consideration of some animals to be killed to protect the rest of the species however What's crazy is you think about what, like, what must have happened? What must have it been like? Some, this had to have happened. Like, the fact that this is a, a thing means that at some point, there was a good-willed, amazing conservationist, conservationalist or whatever, that had to come up with the idea, realize how much hate he was going to get if he tells people, yet still have the passion of conservation so much that he decides to be brave enough to tell everyone anyways even at risk of the lynch mob coming after him which is what they do when you go out and you hunt a giraffe even when you have every right to that's fucking insane that that actually happened now all that being said tell me something let's step back into reality okay have you ever seen a single person show anything close to this level of creativity on Twitter, Facebook, Reddit. No, never. That's absurd. And you know that. These guys who are actually genuinely creative, they don't spend their time on social media. The mere fact that if you disagree with someone on these platforms, you can just block them. Yeah, that's a that's a real surefire way to kill creativity. And uh, like... Every one of these social media platforms has some way of blocking and they go, yeah, this is definitely an, uh, an essential part of our platform. I gotta fucking put this, okay. But yeah, they, they never think to themselves like, hey, maybe if we want to create a social media platform that'll actually make people more creative and, and, and think in a more uh, beneficial way for themselves, maybe we shouldn't have a block button. They do think that, but they go, Oh, if we did that, they wouldn't be on the social media app for long. They would actually go out and improve their own lives. And these social media apps wouldn't make money. So they don't do it. Every feature that a social media app implements, you have to understand their motivation. Every single thing that you think is so great about a social media app is literally there for the purposes of screwing you over and wasting your time. That's why it exists. I explained um, the example of... Uh, the dude who worked with my dad in a different stream, like he was ignorant, but he just did stuff with 100% confidence. And he went in with ignorance. He knew he was ignorant. And he just, he made it work. Mike Tyson, uh, when he was in his prime, he was anything but textbook. John Jones, if you go back and look at uh, John Jones's earlier fights, he was doing shit so stupid and ignorant, but at least he was doing it. And it worked. And no reasonable coach would ever advise you to like put your hands in front of your opponents where they can grab it and then go in for an elbow and then just like front kick them against the cage and then just like knee them in the nose immediately after, like leaving yourself open the entire time defensively. But this dude, this dude didn't bother to care about conventional training. He found an entirely new way of fighting and became the greatest both on the feet and on the ground. It was because of his ignorance. Like, that's what that is. That's ignorance. Tony Ferguson does Wing Chun, a, a martial art that can literally hardly even be called a martial art at this point. Wing Chun is, um, for those of you guys don't, who don't know, 
Wing Chun is a Chinese, like, it, you know what they trained in Kung Fu Panda? All that, like, dumb shit, like that uh, superstitious, like, oh, if you touch this person with this pressure point, then it'll create a, a, a blue fireball and all this, like that. Like, that's, that's Wing Chun. Literally Kung Fu Panda shit. Like, Master Uwe shit, bro. But this dude, Tony Ferguson, trains Wing Chun. He literally, he kicks metal poles until his shins get used to it. So that way it won't hurt when he kicks someone in the shin and it hits their bone. Their bone will break. Tony's won't. Which, you can call it superstition and you can argue about the effectiveness of this strategy. But that doesn't take away from the fact that Tony's one of the greatest to ever do it. And Wing Chun is not what made him the greatest. It was the novel mindset that he had that made him do Wing Chun as well as many other things that made him the greatest, one of the greatest. Or look at Steve Jobs, for example. He's the best example. This dude did not know how to write a single line of code. He didn't know in the slightest. He had Waz doing all the work for him. Like, think about that shit for a second. Think about the, the innovations he made. And after a while of thinking, it actually makes perfect sense. Like, yeah, no shit, he didn't know how to code. When the iPod came out, the best technology for listening to music at the time was cassettes, was CDs, packed into a portable MP3 player that required giant batteries and, and you know, a pack of songs on external hardware. Imagine that being the best technology at the time and you're a programmer or engineer, you know, on the cutting edge. And your boss comes up to you and, and he says, hey, yeah, we're going to change the music uh, industry forever. We're going to change music hardware. Um, we're going to need some good engineers and uh, not to come up with ideas, of course. That, that's not what the engineers are for. The good engineers, um, they work for the best engineers. But the best engineers work for the worst ones. So if you're a good engineer, uh, you work for me. Because I don't know anything. I'm a guy who doesn't even know how to write a line of code. And since you've specialized and you've tunnel visioned and you've put yourself in this box so that your brain capacity is limited to think only in a certain way, not outside the box, it's up to people like me, the innovators, who have, um, you know, touched the, the ether of all these different fields. It's up to me to tell you, um, a guy who can't even code, to, for me to tell you what you should do. And he literally, he was like that disrespectful. He was an asshole. Everyone, it's, it's generally agreed upon that he was a total asshole. But Steve Jobs literally told these people at, the, at that time, he was like, yeah, we're going to take this, um, take this CD. Actually, we're going to take a uh, hundred CDs, put them all together in one package uh, with, with about that much capacity. Actually, not even a hundred. We're going to take a thousand CDs and um, we're going to put them in a very compact storage format um, that we can continue to expand on in the future. And that is uh, modular, by the way. And we're going to put it in this little itty bitty container that fits nice and snug in your pocket. And it can also play any audio format, any codec. Um, and it can connect to computers and it can connect wirelessly. And it has an internal rechargeable battery that you don't need to replace it. And the battery lasts a while and we're going to make it lightweight and durable and uh, you can drop it and, and it'll still work and we're going to make it dust proof and we're going to give it a touch pad. Oh, and we're also going to give it a fucking colored LCD screen while we're at it. Keep in mind, this, this device has to fit in your pockets. And, um, yeah, did I mention it has to, um, last a long time on a nice and beefy internal battery without overheating for that matter? Oh, and we also want to make it look pretty because that's the kind of company we are. And uh, you know what? Fuck it. Make it able to um, power even high impedance headphones in a portable setup. Oh, yeah. And while we're at it, lastly, make it affordable. Like, what the fuck? Who thinks of that shit? Like, no fucking way a, a reasonable, with any in sense, no, no way a sensible engineer would ever think of that because they know the limitations they know what they can and cannot do particularly what they cannot do but knowing what you cannot do 
is that's the opposite of ignorance. Ignorance is thinking you could do anything. Only amateurs, only ignorant people think everything is possible. You guys know the Dunning-Kruger effect where beginners um, in a discipline think they know everything? Because I believe that that's actually a... I believe that the Dunning-Kruger effect where beginners think they know everything in the beginning is actually there for a reason. It's actually a, a built-in mechanism for us to have this sort of like um, beginner's luck, you know? Even when you don't know much about uh, something, you can really expand on it and really change the whole industry because you're not limited by any of these things. Because in all reality, anything is possible. There are no limitations. And the more of an expert you become, the more you understand the limitations. But really, that's a lie. There are no limitations to begin with. And when you're a beginner, and not only a beginner, particularly in technology, because technology, you can make anything happen. Any combination of pixels you want on the screen, you can do it. Literally anything. So when you're a beginner in a field like this, and you understand that, like when you, when you feel the imposter syndrome, and you can understand that you're entering into a new discipline, and you're going higher in a level that you were uh, never meant to go into, or not never meant to, but you feel like you're, you're in a new realm and a new league of people much better than you, much smarter than you. And um, if you can understand Dunning-Kruger's effect and understand that you are a slave to it, go into a field, be ignorant, have one part of your brain feel like you know everything about it, but have another part of your brain understand that part of your brain, that's how you get rid of all your mental limiters. That's how you think outside the box. We're beginners for life, bro. That's like, that's the crew. Beginners for life. Ignorance for the win, boys. Beginner's luck exists for a reason. Like, there's scientific data backing beginner's luck. There's a, uh, there's a, a, a surprising, small but surprising amount of, like, random teenage girls who have never held a basketball in their life who are able to, like, randomly make these, like, half-court shots at uh, NBA games um, and win cars like that. Which is why I don't do that stuff that much anymore. But it's actually these people who have been conditioned to play basketball, who have um, conditioned their muscles to shoot from the three-point line, who have a tough time adapting to half-court if they've never shot half-court. It's actually embarrassing how many times, like, this sort of thing... Like, uh, for example, like, how many times, like, random 13-year-old girls will, like, come in and, like, whoop the best Smash players in the world... We don't ever talk about it. The Smash community, everyone in the community all, is all kind of like, they all stay hush-hush about it because it kind of it kind of makes us look bad. But ask a Smash player, like a pro, in private, off-camera, they'll confirm it. Like how many times a kid will show up at local, mo their mom will bring them to a local. And um, it happens more times than we'd like to admit. More, way, way too many times. Wait, it's embarrassing. Those fucking 13-year-old girls are the bane of, of the Smash community's existence. And 13-year-old boys, too. But for a very different reason, of course. But, um, tss, get it, get it, get it? Because uh, of the pedophilia in the community? <laughs> but, uh, for real. One day, one of these, one of these kids is just going to fuck it. Like, some 12-year-old is going to pick Joker. Or not Joker. They're going to pick, um... Hero and then fucking um, JV4 MK Leo at like Evo Grand Finals or something, and then be like, My favorite character is Isabelle, hashtag Hello Kitty in Smash DLC, or something like that, you know? I swear, I'm literally exposing the Smash community right now. I'm literally exposing the biggest shame in the community. Well, the second biggest, but let's not get into that. But all of this to say, beginner's luck is a real thing. Always, always have the mindset of a beginner. Not always. If you're going into a discipline, if you're going, to, you know, if you're playing soccer uh, and you're going to be one of the greats, eventually, like Ronaldo is not out here thinking like a beginner, right? But if, for most people, if you're going in for the enjoyment, for the fulfillment of the game, for the improvements, for the benefits that it'll offer you to your life, 
you should have the mindset of a beginner even long after you feel like you're a beginner. You should have the mindset of a kid. I think that's a better way to word it. If you ever played table tennis with a lot of people, you'll find that a, a lot of kids, they just, they just pick it up like really fast and they get really good. Like I have two, two little cousins, um, two little babies. They're not babies anymore, but I still think of them as babies. Um, they're like nine years old. They're not babies at all, but um, they're twins, uh, Ruth and Myra. And uh, one of them was really, really good at ping pong when, uh, when I showed it to her and she started playing, played for the first time. And one of them was really, really, really bad. And they're twins. And even, even like, um, even like beer pong with a lot of people, like the first time I ever played beer pong, I crushed these guys who were like veterans at it. Um, I'm not talking about, I'm not, I'm not saying the, the, the girls played beer pong. I'm not saying Ruth and Myra play. I'm talking about like, I'm, I'm on to a different example now. Um, and I'm sure people have encountered that sort of thing in the wild. Like it's actually a very common occurrence. I, I'm sure everyone who goes to parties regularly has encountered people who have never played beer pong in their lives and they played way better than experienced players, but they can only do it on their like first or second try. And it's because beginner's luck. It's a novelty. It's this like willingness to explore. It's not having boundaries. It's like not being trapped in a box. The better you get at a discipline, the further down the path you go, the smaller the box becomes around you. It's often said that um, the world's best swordsman doesn't need to fear the second best swordsman, but they should fear the world's worst swordsman. Like, I'm better than all my friends at Smash. And I attribute that to one sole reason. I don't have a main. I play all the characters. I pick random every time. And I get decent with everyone. And that way, I have a better mechanical understanding, not of a specific character, but of the core mechanics of the game. And when, you know, they get used to a single character, it doesn't take me long for to 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 find patterns in their behavior and encounter them and find weaknesses in their attack patterns and stuff i i like i imagine that i'm playing those characters that they're playing and i'm in their shoes i watch their character and i imagine that i'm playing them so i can predict what they'll do and i can go like if i if i put myself in front of them they'll immediately counter and then i can run in and punish that and I can, I can uh, take advantage of their weaknesses. And they just can't adjust the way I can. Because I put these, these limitations on myself. I, I, I go in with a bit of ignorance, you know? I, I, do, th I do things in these games, by the way. I don't ever, like, um, tell them I'm doing it. Because it's not like, you don't ever talk about these things. Um, but I sometimes put contingencies on myself. Like, okay, my final kill has to be by... Uh, Luigi back throw, or it has to be by Ganon side, or Incineroar revenge kill, you know? Or I have to bait them into a corner and then just cheese them into it, you know, back air them into it at like 0%. And I do that enough to where I, I don't get good at a specific character, but I get good at baiting people. I get good at um, stage control. I get good at... Um, winning exchanges in neutral, you know, in integral parts of competitive Smash play. If you want to play a pro basketball player, by the way, here's a tip. If you want to play a pro basketball player and you want to absolutely demolish them, and here's what you do. You set up a custom basketball hoop that has a slightly further backboard and get a slightly, like, slipperier ball or something, right? And set up the backboard to like have like a bit of a different bit of an odd angle the way it bounces the ball into the um, basket, and uh, maybe set up the the basket to be a bit lower than what the what the pro is used to practicing on, and get used to it. Practice on it for like a few weeks, right? And then get the pro player who has practiced their entire life on the same backboards, on the same like same everything. And uh, they won't be able to win. They won't be able to adjust the way you can. 
and then you hustle them like Josh Nichols and you finesse their cash. However, I mean, if you play legit basketball, actually, if you, even if you do this, a legit basketball player is still probably going to crush you because there is a lot of... Basketball is one of those sports where you have to get good at, at things all around, um, not just the very specific thing that you're doing. A good basketball player will also be good at, uh, you know, the basketball-related games um, in, in the arcade and, like, ring toss and that sort of thing. You know, they'll, they'll be good at all these things. They'll be all-rounder. But if you want to get good at basketball and, and you want to beat chess players at their own game and you want to do the... Like, you want to reach high levels of a discipline, these strategies work for that. Like... For example, basketball players, they move in a certain way, right? You could tell when someone's a pro. They just move different. Uh, if you go to any any um, public court, you watch people. You could tell, okay, this dude's been this dude's been doing it for a while. Like their whole their whole body revolves around the geometry of the dribble, this oscillating dribble. Uh, it's like the dribble is actually what's in control here, and their body is just a. Uh, uh, a piece of that dribble just hanging on to it. It's not like they're moving and the ball's around them. They're around the ball. Uh, it's a beautiful, beautiful, like a it's, a, it's a work of art, the way these people move. And usually it's because they've been playing since they were little babies. Because most pros um, have parents who are also big on basketball, who um, get them in young. And by young, I mean like like two years old. Like if you aren't playing basketball by the time you're like six seven and if you want to make it into the nba <laughs> good luck um but there was this guy who understood these principles that i'm talking about there was this guy i think he was like 25 or something and he wanted to be able to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with top basketball players but he knew that normal training wouldn't do it the way he needed it to. Like, it, the way that, that kids and their, like, plastic jello scrambled scrambled eggs brains can develop, like, he didn't have that anymore. The fluid intelligence was gone by the time he was 25. Well, a lot of it was gone. So he needed a new strategy, something to push his brain to be more creative and more malleable than a normal 25-year-old brain would be just playing basketball, right? Just trying to get good at basketball. So he built these glasses, these like weighted, weighted glasses. And uh, they would have like covers on the bottom that had weights on them. Um, and they would swing around. And that made it so that whenever he looked down or like turned his head significantly like that, um, he couldn't see. And so he had to look straight. He always had to look straight. He had to look like, like how basketball players only look at their opponents. They don't ever look at the ball. So... If you've ever tried to dribble like this without um, having practiced it before for like months at least, you can't do it. Like you literally cannot dribble like this unless you've had practice. If you try to, and we all made attempts, right? We all, we all tried it here and there. Like, oh, let me try to dribble the ball without looking and just moving forward. You try to do it and you're not experienced. The ball is going to either go too far away or more often than not, it's going to hit your foot and roll off to the side. And it sucks because now you got to go over and, and uh, get the ball and you're punished for it. But that actually, that's supposed to happen. It makes you better at, at it. The punishment um, incentivizes your brain to uh, pick up on the patterns because your brain will be able to pick up on it. You, you have to trust in the process. And this happens enough to where it's frustrating for kids and... Um, parents will see this as an ideal strategy for kids to get good at dribbling. Yeah, let them let them experience that, right? And eventually, they'll start to start they'll start to look away from the ball because it'll get very competitive, and people will get better and better at dribbling. And when they're playing around with kids at their school, um, they'll need to actually look at the other students because those students will be looking at them, and so it'll push them to uh, power through the pain and. Uh, force themselves to put in like a limitation like okay I can't look at the ball I have to I have to actually um look at the other person and their brain will will get the message it'll it'll get the message that they have to pick up the slack and uh they can't look at the ball 
So it'll, it'll force the brain without having any other options. You have to back the brain to a corner. You have to understand what the brain does and what it's capable of. And you, you make it do your bidding. So after you back the brain into a corner and you give it no other option, the brain wants other options. It wants the easy way out. It wants the social media. It wants the video games. It wants the easiest, the easiest possible solution, the path of least resistance, right? So when you give the brain no way out but one option and you tell it this is the only way and we're going to keep going through this pain that you clearly don't want. I know you don't want this. We're going to keep going through this pain unless you figure it out. You only have one option. The brain will give in to your demands. It'll do what you want it to do. And a common theme, theme that you'll find among human beings who do great things is like every brain is capable of handling great adversity, right? But nobody's willing to put their brains through that great adversity. But the great people do. And this guy, this guy who was trying to play basketball, he did. And after all it took was like less than a year. For someone that age to do that sort of thing, less than a year of, of that kind of struggle is meaningless, is meaningless amount of time. And his brain, I mean, it did take a while. You know, a kid could do it very easily. A kid can learn how to ride a bike in one second. Like literally one second. I'm not even, it's not an exaggeration. Like they can literally learn in one second. But it did take a while, but his brain finally said like, Fine, I guess you are my little pog champ. I mean, fine, I'll figure out how this uh, ball pattern works and I'll embed it deep in inside um, if it really is that important to you. You know, if you're really going to keep doing this, if you really want to know how to dribble without looking at it, I'd rather just look at it, I'd rather take the easy way out, but if you really want it that badly, man, then whatever, I'll do it. And that's what his brain said, metaphorically. And after that, um, it was only after like a few months, actually, and not even a year, I think. Um, he didn't even pick up a basketball before that. But just a few months after picking up a basketball for the first time, he would literally go to courts and play, and people would point at him and be like, hey, yo, is he a, is he a pro? I don't recognize him. He's moving like he's in the NBA. Is he in college or something? Uh, he must be a, 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 a impressive prospect. I don't know. what. Why don't we get his autograph or something? Like people would literally say that about him. He literally gave out his autograph to people who, who he'd mess around to be like, yeah, I'm in college. I'm about to get drafted, uh, whatever. Like he literally say that to troll people and he would give out his autograph. It's limitations, people. Limitations. I'm going to lose my voice tomorrow. Dude, I've been talking for too long and I have food. I should be eating this food. But um. There is a common theme among these greats. Sigmund Freud, Alexander, Socrates. And that dude was illiterate as fuck, by the way. Like, Socrates actually, like, couldn't... Was able to read worse than Floyd Mayweather, alright? If one day I decide to get good at chess, I'll start, I'll start playing in really novel and interesting ways. I'll put restrictions on myself. I'll be like, okay, in the beginning, I'll sacrifice my queen for his knight and see if I can still win like this. And if anything, it'll force me to play in a more defensive way with a lot more pressure on me. And um, I'll probably lose most of the games. But when I play the games where I'm, I have even odds and I don't sacrifice my queen in the beginning, I'll be an absolute beast at the game. I'm starting to go a little off track here. But um, I'm talking, no, this is not off track. I'm talking about, I'm talking about learning. I'm talking about the, the, the best way, well, my, my, the best way I know to teach yourself and to teach others. Um, and this ties in with all the things I've said, limiting yourself, ignorance, and boredom. Because you're going to be very bored, you know, playing in these very limited ways. All these things actually are very, they have a lot of overlap, and this all ends up being one sort of principle in the end that you just understand intuitively. Um, and you just push your body to do. But if I were to put it into words, the best way I could teach somebody would be splitting it up into these three things that you take to heart. So yeah, 
I don't want to get too off topic, but I think that's pretty much everything, actually. Be ignorant, be bored, and be limited. Boom. Real life, practical, actual advice to increase creativity. Not that boring ass, vague bullshit that everyone gives you on like TikTok and stuff, all this motivational advice. Nah, I'm, ta- I'm giving you real shit. I can't believe I'm doing this. This is crazy. This is crazy. This is the best stream I've ever done. And um, see, the great thing about following these strategies that have these like negative connotations that these have is that everyone will think you'll fail. This is the best part of all this, is that everyone will think you'll fail if you're limiting yourself, you're doing stuff. If you say what you're doing, if you say, you're, yeah, I'm, I'm going to be ignorant in, on this subject. If you say that sort of thing, nobody will have any expectations of you. And it's the most satisfying thing in the world when you succeed and you shock everyone. Uh, actually, I got a video about that. I got a video. I need to bless my voice a little bit and I'm going to eat while I'm watching this, but this is, this is, this dude sent it to me on Discord actually a few days ago, and uh, it's by, it's by, you know, the, the, the man himself, the winner of, the winner of everything, never lost a round, the winner of all competitions to ever be competed, everyone welcome the American gangster himself. An athlete with momentum is in the better spot. The athlete on the grind is in the better spot. Some athletes are. I will see guys, I mean, I I can use it on a real short term, not over the course of a year or two years, a real short term, a day, a two day tournament. And you'll see it on all levels, guys. You'll see this from March Madness to the NCAA wrestling championships to the Olympic games. Somebody gets on what's known as a roll. They come out there, they have a great first match, and boom, that springboards them into a great second match, which builds this momentum and pushes them all the way through, and all of a sudden they got a gold medal or a championship to hold up, and you go, how the heck did they do that? And they can never duplicate it. (laughs) It's this one good tournament that they can look back on and all their dreams come true, and a lot of them have to retire when it's over. You'll see these things in sport, but there's something very real about that. There's something very real about going into something where there is no pressure or expectation on you. No expectations. For some guys, they will live up to their expectations, of which if those are low, that's how... I think, I think, like, okay, Chael Sonnen is experienced, right? He's a fighter, wrestler, collegiate, whatever, right? So he sees this, and he might attribute things um, that are correlative to actually be cause, causation. But I don't think that it's the... Uh, lack of expectations that puts people in this, these positions. I think that's a correlation. I think it's these other factors that go into it that both cause this um, this on a roll state as well as uh, the lack of expectations. But I don't think lack of expectations is actually doing anything to cause. Maybe a little bit. Maybe a little bit. But um, actually, I mean, yeah. Look, he's a lot older than me. A lot more experienced. And what he's saying has merit. You know, you go in, no pressure, right? There's no pressure underneath these guys. So yeah, um, I don't want to jump to conclusions, but he take take what I'm saying with a grain of salt and also take what he's saying with a grain of salt because we both know, uh, you know, quite a bit about what we're talking about here, yet we'll both come up with totally different answers. So that that means that we're both fucking idiots on this subject. But we both have something to say about it. So take what both of us are saying with a grain of salt and uh, understand that these are just two different perspectives. But we're probably going to disagree. They'll go out and perform. But for some other athletes, it will, it will pull some kind of something off mentally. It will unlock something when there's simply nothing to lose. There's also something to be said for many athletes. And it all depends. I think he's speaking from experience, actually, which is... In my opinion, yeah. You know what? I'll grant you that. I'll grant you that. That is that is the best way to really learn things. And I don't have much experience. I have a little bit of experience, like in the film world and things like that. But I mean, Chael Sonnen is a uh, is 
you know, world champion in every sport that is that has ever existed or will ever exist, never lost a round. So, uh, dude, I want to see the comments. Uh, Michael Bisping actually cited his lack of preparation against Rockwell as an advantage, saying that uh, having overtrained for every fight before, he went in feeling really good and fresh. This video actually hits deep. Uh, da -da 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 -da. I ended up in a psych ward. I don't even know what the hell is going on here. I'm not reading all that. And dude, the only person I knew, the only person that I know that made money using their mouth was his ex-wife. That's what Chael Sonnen said in Trash Talk to um, Tito. Um, I remember when John Jones didn't take <laughs> Chael on short notice. He didn't want the smoke. <laughs> Tony Ferguson, the type of guy to know, or Kevin Lee fits all in all this. Of course, obligatory Tony Ferguson comments in here. Chael needs a something very real and a something to be said t-shirt. I agree. I agree. I would bail that. I would buy that. Bro, no, I want a t-shirt that has everything that Chael says. He's like, there's something something very real, something to be said. And the, another quote, like, I want the bigger ones that are said more often. Uh, like, um, uh, and so it would, and so I bring you this and I offer you this and that sort of thing. I want, I want like all of those on a t-shirt. That would be great, bro. That would be great. Chael Sonnen, please make it happen. Um, <laughs> Papa Chael uploads 14 videos in a day in three days. <laughs> dude, this dude was spamming these videos. Um, that's how le Left Hook Larry was born. Overthinking. Who the hell is this? To, uh, okay. But yeah. Overanalyzing separates the body from the mind. Nice way of wording it. Nice way of wording it. Tony Ferguson, like I was saying earlier. Tony Ferguson is probably one of the best options out there. Yeah. 99% unpredictable. Good luck preparing for him. Um, he's a bit older now. He's like 40 years old. So yeah, no, it's a, you're going to... It's not it's not a, a difficult thing so much anymore. Follow fundamentals, principles, but yeah, even still, he's a he's a force of nature, force to be reckoned with. Um, there's something very real about it. Oh, and by the way, like, dude, I, I want that T-shirt. Please make it. Depends on the guy. It all depends on the guy. There's something I can agree to be with said that. for I an can athlete agree who that. has a clear head. I have seen a number of, as have you, on all levels, all the way up to the NFL where you get some team that is as close to undefeated or undefeated in the preseason and they go down in round one of the playoffs. We've seen this many times. There's something to be said for somebody who comes in with a clear head. By the way, I live in Atlanta, born and raised, which means I... Uh, I watch the Falcons games. So, yes. I can attest to that. I can confirm. Which is what those teams that went into the playoffs undefeated had at the beginning of the season because they were coming off of a layoff. They got together. They were positive. They did some training in the offseason, maybe more than the other teams did. They started early. The other teams kind of built to their peak, and these teams fizzled out. We see it all the time with athletes, and we don't know what the answer is with Justin, and we don't know what the answer is with Tony. But we do know that we are now confronted oh. with this situation. Pandemic. Bro, this was um that event. Uh, Tony Ferguson versus Justin Gaethje. Situation for each guy. This was before that. Does Tony do better because of the grind? Does Justin do better because he had a clear head and, by the way, was focused on Conor McGregor? Wasn't even thinking about Tony. Yeah. For some of you, you're going to think, oh, my gosh, that's terrible. But then again, Tony was uh, focused on Khabib. So I I'd say it goes both ways. I would hate to go into a fight with a guy that I focus on. I didn't plan for it. I didn't strategize. I didn't have a training camp for Some guys won't even do it. Yeah. They're planning for an orthodox guy. That guy gets hurt. A new guy steps in. That guy's southpaw. Boom, the fight's off. They just, they won't even do it. I have not been trained for a southpaw. End of story won't go And out. I hate those guys. A, a hundred times. The other guys go, well, that's a totally new challenge I hadn't even thought of. 
And there's something I admire known as that. paralysis by analysis in sport, which means if you sit <laughs> and you focus on something so much and you analyze it, you will freeze. You will just absolutely freeze. And other guys, boy, the looser they are. Not just in sport. The absolute better. We had a couple of things happen in amateur wrestling that worked this way. Joe He's speaking Cologne, from experience, yeah. Perhaps the most recent. Joe Cologne was second at something known as the World Team Trials. Exact same process as the Olympic Trials, but in non-Olympic year. So every three years you have the World Championships, every fourth year you have the same tournament, but they call it the Olympic Games. All right. So he ends up second, which means he doesn't make the team. He doesn't get to go. The number one guy who does make the team gets hurt at the absolute last minute. Joe Cologne has just enough time to make weight, goes to the World Championships, but he goes in with a completely clear mind. He hadn't studied the bracket. He hadn't studied the guys. You know, he was out getting better and looking for a year later when an opportunity would arise again where he could go out and try to make a team. <laughs> Rare opportunity. But I mean, it was just a different spot Yeah, he mentally. wasn't. That makes sense. In wrestling, you have to you have to plan very, very far in advance, especially because wrestling is a... Cutting weight is so deeply... Cutting water weight is so deeply, deeply embedded in wrestling now, in, in high-level competition, that uh, you have to plan for these things way in advance. If you're not if you're not preparing for something like six months in advance, then everyone in wrestling would consider that ill prepared. Cruises right out, grabs a medal for the country. One of the best tournaments that he ever put together, but he didn't even know who the guys were. I mean, he's looking around going, okay, who do I got next? I'm not even supposed to be here. He enjoyed the moment and it, it parlayed him. You could see it in his wrestling. We had a guy named <laughs> Brandon Egham. Brandon Egham, same spot, second in the world team trials to the great Kale Sanderson. I can't recall what happened, but Kale elected to not go to the World Championships. They fell Egum. They sent him at the last minute. Egum makes it to the finals. <laughs> he didn't prep for anybody. He See, uh, uh, combat sports is particularly prone to this, I think. I think he, this dude's got examples for days. I don't have that many examples. Like, Smash Community, for sure. But n no one particularly stands out because of all the, like, the sheer number of, like, 12-year-olds. That crushed top players. Like, remember that kid who, like, beat Samsora, who was, like, number two in the world at the time? And he, like, beat him with, like, three different characters. <laughs> Didn't even play his main. It was absurd, bro. Like, yeah, the era of the gods is over, and it's never coming back. Did plan for anybody? He didn't get... But the sheer number of the... It's like, nobody particularly stands out. I, I think listening to people in combat sports, you'll have a lot better... Uh, You'll have examples of like actual people that you can really look at and see what they do. Game plan, watch the tape, study. He wasn't even going. So there's something to be said for this. There's other guys that get thrown into a situation at the last minute, and that's an absolute meltdown and a panic. Absolute yeah. meltdown and a panic, which is always... And that's what you'd expect, actually. That's what people on the surface would expect. Excuse me, but I came from a tournament background where you never knew who you were going to have. And then even once you know who showed up that day, it all gets played out by a straight line, Brett. You don't know who's going to win, and 40 minutes later, you're on the mat with them. So the opponent just didn't really factor in for me. Now, because Gaethje and Tony have the same background as I do with their tournament guys, their wrestlers. I oh, Tony's wrestler? I didn't know that. I don't, I don't remember ever... Maybe he was a different, maybe he, was, he wasn't like all American or anything, but like, I didn't know that. To think there's going to be something positive from a performance standpoint for Gaethje. I tend to think Tony, which is consistent, one of the most consistent guys amongst the most consistent athletes that we've ever seen in the sport. I yeah, tend to because at this point, Tony was on a 12 fight win streak, I believe think he's going to go out and be just fine too but there is something to be guessed as we speculate to this man well, who's actually i think tony was the favorite of this fight was he not he was fighting could be supposed to i think the reason why people were uh giving gaethje a lot more credit was because tony made weight a month in advance which really as much as tony might like to not make excuses and be like nah that didn't affect my performance no that would affect your performance. That would. The, the, we have biological limitations, all right? As much as I might preach all these things, we have biological limitations that would affect your performance. 
no doubt about it. And honestly, you wouldn't know what kind of performance you would have had if you had chosen to wait to, 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 to make weight um, when the fight got canceled with Khabib and waited for uh, things to play out with Gaethje. Get the takedown, and who's going to hit two? And you know, Gaethje's going to hit him hard, but Tony's got a great chin. Yeah, you can break down some of those X's and O's, but some of the intangibles, such as the mindset, which largely going to be... I think we learned in this fight. They both got great chins. Yes, you're going to have to hedge your guess when you're making your prediction. I think we could all physically just concede that Gaethje is right. Should this see rounds four and five, logically and physically, great, it favors Tony. Not a level playing field. But, ah, uh, man. Looking back at it now, I don't know. I don't know so much anymore. Because looking, looking into rounds four and five nowadays with, with Tony and Gaethje, yeah, Tony has the advantage in cardio, for sure. Gaethje has the advantage in heart. Um, so, and I, I, I don't, I think these, um, I think they're pretty even in the later rounds, actually, right now. But I think Gaethje overall, overall would take rounds off of him one round at a time. Tony knew what was going on. Gaethje had a hope of what's going on. Knowing versus hope. Okay, hope isn't the best strategy in the world, but sometimes it's all you got. Knowing is a damn good strategy. But I do think that you have some variables here. And I think as we look forward to this fight, you need to weigh them. You know what's funny? Justin was the ignorant one in that fight. He won. <laughs> it's kind of odd how he was making this video. The chill curse didn't apply this time. Actually, it might have. I think he might have um, said that. He thought Tony was going to win. But, um, yeah. That's it right there. That's the key to creativity. Is to fill your head with less. When people say less is more, this is one of those instances where you could take that quote and you can be like, you know what? I get what that means. The, the, more, the more empty space in your brain for it to operate autonomously, the more creative you can be. Not you will be, but the more creative you can be. The more you can fill your head um, with new information, with new novel information. But if you fill your head with all these things beforehand, you overanalyze all this stuff, the less empty space there will be to learn things as you go which is how you play sport. Sport is an act of learning. Even though well, every great philosopher always tells you to empty your minds in some, some way, one way or another, they always have some sort of quote that roughly translates to empty your mind. It's society that tells us to learn everything. It's a society that tells us, oh, you should always be educating yourself. You should always be learning something, you know. You should always be updated with the world. Um, you know, keep keep updated with current news and current events. It never occurs to the common person, like the common NPC, I should say, that maybe there is a such thing as too much information. You have no idea how many times I've heard from family members, oh, I should I should watch the news because it's so important to know what's going on with the world. Then I ask, why? And they don't have an answer. And I'm a, I'm a bit of an extreme example because I don't care about the week, the month, what year it is. I don't keep track of how old I am. I don't, I don't care about when my birthday is. I don't celebrate any of these arbitrary things. I don't eat three meals a day. Sometimes I eat one meal. Sometimes I eat six. I eat when I'm hungry. I, uh, I don't think about when breakfast, lunch, and dinner is... I don't think about what is breakfast. I just consider food, food. If it's 3 a.m. and I'm wide awake, I'm going to be streaming. But if it's 3 a.m. and I'm wide awake and I feel hungry, I'll eat. And I don't consider the time. I don't consider what time I sleep. I sleep like a pirate, like a One Piece character. You know, in One Piece, they just, like, if I, if I feel tired, I lay down where I stand and I sleep. And whenever I wake up, 
is whenever I naturally wake up. I don't fill my head with any information that I don't use. I literally never know what time of day it is or anything. Like there's, I hear the birds outside right now. And I, I see a time, I see a time it's like 8 a.m. Holy fuck, I've been streaming for so long. You guys hear the birds and that, uh, those, those pipes right now? Yeah, those are the pipes above my room. But I don't ever think about like things that, that don't, that aren't going to help me with anything, like specifically help me with anything. Like, am I going to be like, oh, I'll start working hard when this time comes around. Like, who cares what time it is? I'm doing the best I can all the time. Why even set deadlines? Like, why remember deadline dates? I'm always going to do things at max capacity. I'm going to finish things as soon as I possibly can. So if I don't finish something by a deadline, then I couldn't have it done by the deadline date anyways. So I never bother to remember deadline dates. I just submit things as soon as I'm done with them, and I finish them as soon as I, po I can possibly do them. And I've never, ever once missed a deadline date with the strategy. I'm going to do everything to the absolute limit of my capacity. But I'm a very extreme example. You don't have to go this far. I never, I never said anything about this being the right way to live life. You know, creative, being creative and, and, and living your life in the right way. I never said that, that uh, it'll give you the kind of fulfillment you want out of life. Um, this is not for everyone. Um, no, I can't ever condone anyone to go as far as I've, I've gone. But I'd be lying if I said that choosing to ignore most of the world didn't make me more creative. Here, I got another video actually. Let me, let me, let me pull it up. You might be wondering, like, if I have, like, timings for when I play these videos. I don't. I, I put a video on whenever my throat starts hurting and I need to rest my voice. It's 5.30 a.m. in Zurich, and I have a confession to make. I have recently been compulsively checking the news on my phone. I go over to CNN. I read the BBC. There's always some fluff. Prince Harry gets tested for I look HIV. At the Wall Street Journal and The Economist. I look at 538. What are the chances that Donald Trump could really win the election? I like trying to predict what's going to happen in the future, even though that's somewhat of a foolhardy errand. I just, I don't know. I can't resist. Clickbaity. It's superficial. It's meaningless. I don't need it for my life, and yet there it is. So. I am checking the news too much. I'm checking it in lines, when I'm on escalators, when I'm in the bathroom, whenever I have a spare minute really and I'm a bit bored, when I should be doing other things, when I have presentations to write or uh, a new video to edit, and I think it is an addiction. You know, we're not drawn to things that necessarily give us pleasure all the time. The scientific research has shown that we seem to enjoy a random mixture of punishment and pleasure that that is the thing that we get most drawn to i don't think it's random but i agree with the um essence of what he's saying all punishment or all pleasure no that's that's no good which explains basically how video games are designed they're designed to give you some sort of Fantastic. intermittent rewards but always create new challenges and make things harder for you and give you punishment as well because it's that mixture that really hooks our brains and part of this gets us trying to optimize that system. So in a similar way, I keep going back to the news. I think another reason why we might be addicted to news is what I call the obesity theory. And uh, well, that's kind of an analogy to how much food we consume. You know, I think that our bodies are pretty well evolved uh, to keep us alive, to make sure that we can survive through famines. And in the past, calories were pretty difficult to come by. So whenever there were a lot of calories around to be had, we would just eat a little bit more and we'd put on some extra weight padding for the leaner times and so that we could we could survive them. And in a world where calories are scarce, well, that's a very good strategy to have. Now that calories are so much more prevalent, readily available, well, this is a, a terrible strategy and it's led to 
a lot of obesity in uh, in a lot of the countries around the world. You know, it's kind of like moths. Yeah, more people die of obesity today than of starvation. Moths guide themselves by light sources, and in the past, at night, the only major light sources you'd have would be the stars and the moon, the planets. Those are so far away that if your guidance strategy is keep those light sources at a constant angle to you, then basically you go in a straight line. But once small local sources of light come into being, like candles, well, then that strategy results in circling around the candle and possibly... Wow, we're just moths. That's all we are. ...possibly spiraling into the candle leading to your certain death. So uh, an evolutionary strategy that is adaptive for uh, a historical environment is then horribly maladaptive in this new environment. And, and all of our evolutionary strategies are adapted for a historical environment. All of them, every single one of them. And None of them like are adapted the same for same way now. with how we approach food and, and possibly the same way with the way we approach information. Information used to be scarce. And exactly. This is what I mean when I say there could be a such thing as too much information. After all, not that many people watch the more intelligent YouTubers like Veritasium. People are too focused on fucking like, like Mr. Beast giving out a million dollars to somebody, which don't get me wrong, entertaining videos, right? But like useless. And it's valuable. Knowledge is power. Who wouldn't want more power? So when information's on offer, I think our brains kind of want it. We take it as much as we can get it. Now it's kind of a maladaptive strategy because a lot of that information is useless to our lives. It yeah. really adds nothing. The vast majority of information you will consume in your life is nonsense. It's garbage. And people will tell you, oh, you should read books. No, even with books, the vast majority of books that exist out there is absolute nonsense. Thing, and yet, and yet we feel drawn to it. Vasa Vogel. Did I pronounce that right? Vasa Vogel. <laughs> Pretty sure I'm doing it wrong. Then there's another idea about why we need so much news, and it sort of dovetails off this concept called cognitive surplus. This is kind of the next phase in a movement that's been underway since the agricultural revolution, freeing up people's time so that, you know, from the hunter-gatherer days we would spend all our time just maintaining our bodies and finding food for ourselves, really taking care of uh, immediate survival needs. And gradually, over time, we've become less and less involved. We, we need fewer and fewer hours to ensure that we can survive. And now we're moving into the next phase of that, where uh, it becomes even more pronounced. Uh, knowledge workers can uh, spend more and more of their time doing passion projects, things that interest them, which is, I think, why we have YouTubers in the first place. But at the same time, I think some of that cognitive surplus is not being used for productive means. I think a lot of it might just be going into a demand. Slippery slope. How would you define productive means then? And then you go down the rabbit hole and you go, wait, none of this is actually productive, even YouTubers. As much as I might love YouTube, truly, truly love YouTube, I have to also admit that. But continue. And for distraction. And so I think there is such a thing now as the distraction economy where there's all this new... Fr precisely, precisely. I've edited for um, YouTubers and TikTokers, and this is exactly how I look at things when I edit. I look at things as, okay, how can I distract people the most? What can I do to bring people in to this realm that is not real? What can I do to send people down a rabbit hole of information that they have no business going down? And if you can develop strategies to send people down rabbit holes that have absolutely nothing to do with them, that are absolutely useless to their lives, then that means that you've created effective strategies to capture people's attention and distract them no matter what kind of content you have. And the content itself doesn't matter all that much, but the execution, the distribution, and the marketing of that content is actually what matters. And those are repeatable and testable and uh, 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 doable strategies with a budget. So then you can go to people with budgets with money and you could tell them, hey, you wanna buy fame? Well, I know the strategies, here they are. Pay me a commission. And that's how I made a whole bunch of money. Um, editing for YouTubers, but yeah. Free time 
you want to think of it that way. But it's not really free time. It's kind of dead time. You know, that time when you're waiting in line at the supermarket or, uh, you know, where you're waiting to board a plane or you're on the bus. Or... This is huge. This is huge what he's talking about. Because people on their phones, like you're on your phone on like a plane or a bus or whatever, and nobody, you're not actually being productive, right? And nobody says they're being productive. That doesn't stop the fact that your brain actually thinks you're being productive. Like the part of your brain that evolved to be productive truly thinks that you're being productive by not just wasting the time just standing around being on the train. Whatever. It's this extra time that we have which we can now fill with stuff. And we like feeling productive. And so... That's what I said. That may also be part of the need to pull out the phone and feel like you're using every minute of every day to do something productive. And if you're gathering more information, maybe it doesn't matter what it's about as long as you're just consuming. No, the and, and throughout uh, all of history, we would do this. We would do this. It's just we never had the opportunity. It's like, it's like if phones didn't exist, you'd be on the bus and you'd be desperately, desperately trying to figure out something to do to ease the boredom, right? But there would be no option. So it's not like, it's not like people throughout history, you know, ancient humans would be in these situations and they'd be like, well, I'm in this situation. I'm going to choose to meditate instead. You know, so I can inflict some boredom on myself. They didn't have a choice. They were just always bored. And so they would always chase something to ease the boredom. And the majority of the time, there was nothing to do it. Um, and so when they, when they did chase it, and they did manage to achieve it, it was uh, something truly meaningful. This is kind of interesting because a lot of YouTube videos, right, are just playing into the distraction economy. It's how we can support ourselves is because there are Facts. people with time who want to watch the things that we make. You're trading time for our money. But I want to announce... What a waste of fucking video. time that was just now. Why would you do that? This The hypocrite, I mean... Uh, I guess that's proving your point. You, I'm watching you and I'm wasting my time. Nice. Nice job. I don't know if that was intentional. I think that was intentional. Nice job, Veritasium. Thanks for making me look like a fool for watching you that I'm putting myself on a low information You could have cut that. That means no more news sites, no more casual surfing. And instead, if I find myself with some dead time, I'm either going to use it to let my mind wander and think over the things exactly. I'm contemplating. The modern struggle. This is what you have to do now in this modern world. Or I'm going to use it to do something productive. Work on the projects that uh, actually need my attention. And I kind of would recommend that you do the same. Try it out. Try it out just for a little bit. See how, how it goes uh, to put yourself on a low information diet. You know, there's some real advocates of low information diet. People like Tim Ferriss, who wrote the 4-Hour Workweek. And uh, he recommends that, you know, if you really want to know what's happening in the world, if you want to find out some news, then go and talk to someone and just let them tell you. Because then at least you're having a social interaction, right? Maybe talk to a stranger. That's what he would recommend. Nice. That's a nice strategy. I didn't even think about that. That is a good way to know what's happening in the world. Because people will condense all the information down for you and tell you, they'll remove the biases that when they, when they spot them and um, point them out where they are to, their, to the best of their ability and things like that. You'll be getting a very, very nice um, filtered set of information. That is, and, and people, you know, if you ask a stranger, People want to share that information. They, they'll look out for you. They'll, they'll give you the information in good faith. They'll give the information to you um, with your best interest in mind, right? And they won't know your political leaning, so they'll, they, they'll tend to be a bit more apolitical about it if you just ask a stranger. That's brilliant. Wow. I might go ahead and do that. I'm writing that down. CGP Grey is uh, another big proponent of the low information diet. And I gotta say, I kind of agree with him, even though I find it very difficult to execute. And then there are people like Brady Heron who would argue that uh, Indeed, actually it is a low information diet is a bad thing and that you should be taking part in what's happening in the world. You should be aware yeah, it's BS. of everything that's going on because that is part of being a good citizen of this planet is being aware of what's happening, the experiences of your fellow. That's what I always hear. I always hear, hey, why don't you... Uh, study up on like the can presidential candidates. Why don't you vote? I don't, I don't know anything. I tell them like I'm not qualified to vote. I don't know anything about the candidates. He's like you have a civic duty, uh, you know, you have a responsibility as a citizen, you know, 
it's an it's a ethical thing. You have to vote. And I'm like, okay, I'd vote for Trump then. And they'd be like, no, 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 never mind, fine, don't vote. And, and so, yeah, they don't want me to educate myself and vote unless it follows their political ideology. But yeah. They're human beings. But um, I, I, I think I would disagree with him on that. I think it's really important, to, you know, what's happening in your local circle. But beyond that, maybe there's very little you can do. And maybe you're just kind of deluding yourself to think that um, being aware of those things is actually a benefit to anyone. Facts. It would be a benefit to you if, if you lived in ancient times and you lived in a tribe of 100, 200 people. Um, every little piece of information you got about the world was a was your world it was your immediate surroundings and it's very useful information to have but you're diluting yourself if you're getting all the information about the world today so what happens if we all go on low information diets i do think that we become more society regresses but it depends on what you mean by society and what you mean by regress society technologically regresses people people go back to living in smaller groups of people and i think that actually makes people hap people happier People stop, uh, you know, family stops deciding to move so far away from each other to, to get job opportunities. You know, instead of making $100,000 a year, they choose to make $200,000 a year living a thousand miles away from their family members. Meanwhile, they could live a more meaningful life and, and uh, you know, a more meaningful, have a more meaningful future and give their kids a more meaningful future to grow up alongside the kids of their family members and things like that, you know? Um, People won't feel the need to, to allow themselves to be so disconnected from each other. And, and I think all around in general, low information diet and, and low everything diet, low diet, <laughs> like literal low diet and, and just moderation in general across the board just makes the world a better place. Productive because, you know, you're going to use your hours for things that matter. And even if you don't do something that you actually need to get done with that time, I think letting your mind rest is valuable. I think that our brains are designed to spend some of their time just wandering, not tied to any particular idea. And in those moments, I think the- People always have this misconception that, th that like doing nothing is valueless. Doing nothing is doing nothing. No, you're always doing something. If you're doing nothing, trust the process. You're doing something while you're doing nothing. And that something is very valuable. The things that maybe are deeper in your subconscious may kind of bubble up and, and you may have some realizations. It's kind of like when I was in college and uh, I'd be doing exams. If I got stuck on a question or two, I'd often go to the bathroom in the middle of the exam. It was not as a crazy strategy or anything, but I often just found that I had to. And uh, it was frequently when I was in the bathroom that the solution hit me, just kind of bubbled up from somewhere. Like I'd been thinking so hard about it, it blocked me from really seeing the answer. So often when That's I- That's literally what Chael Sonnen was talking about. You, you overanalyze and eventually you freeze up. With a clear head, the answers can flow in. It was just completely- That's what I've been saying too. You fill your head with too much information. There's no room for the new information to come flowing in. Distracted, that's when the idea came to me. And uh, what does a world look like in which we have none of that bored time? I think it's valuable, and I'm gonna reclaim mine. You wanna be bored with me? Let's go for a walk. I'll be bored with you, Veritasium. Nice, nice, nice. Fucking love this dude. It bothers me that it's red. But, okay, yeah, this video, this video, I'm, I'm not gonna um, play all these videos, but this video, so the quote, wait, this is not a video, I, this is a new one that I just found. Uh, eh, uh, maybe I'll watch it later, I'll, I'll check in my history later, or I'll just leave it here. Um, this video, I really like this one. This is a short video. Uh, I'm not gonna react to it right now. But watch this one. Watch this one. This is the, this is the link. Here, here's the link. YouTube.be/slash this thing. Um, 
and it's called Immediacy by Two Veritasium. If I got a text. Okay, cool. I'm just responding to some text. I hope I got another one. Okay. One sec. But yeah, here, I'm going to leave this up on the screen. Okay. So, there's this video as well. I knew Veritasim made a video about boredom, and I, I remember, I stole a lot of his ideas in what I said just now. I remember watching this video. I think um, Vsauce, I remember, see, Vsauce actually has a good video on boredom. Right here. Why do we get bored? And I think his video is actually even better because, you know, he's Vsauce, the juggernaut. The Part king, of this video was... The king of um, YouTube education. So, yeah. Go watch that video as well. But what Veritasium was saying... A part of it really resonated with me. It's like, should you, is it, a, is it really a good idea to only consume the information that is readily available to you in a close proximity to you? Like things that you're directly involved with. And I follow that philosophy, whether, whether it's a good thing or not, that's something I, like I could, I could walk you through the step-by-step -step process on how to build a combustion engine from scratch because I'm involved with that. But if you ask me to name five football players or five fashion brands or uh, ask me what day of the week it is or when the birthdays are for everyone I know or like name three politicians, I wouldn't know. Even if you ask me what the current president is, I know it's um, uh, Joe Biden, but I didn't know until like a week after he became president because people would talk about him. I never bothered to check when he became president. And I felt great. I felt like the whole world was like, I looked at the whole world, paying attention to things that had nothing to do with them, and I'm like, y'all are some fools. I pity you. I'm, I feel sorry for these people spent wasting all their time. I felt so liberated that I didn't know. I didn't care. I didn't bother to find out. It was just unavoidable. People would talk about him too much. And... um I could tell you about, uh, you know, TV shows and things like that. I could tell you about storytelling principles in those TV shows and video games. But uh, I wouldn't be able to confidently tell you uh, who the, the mayor of my city is or the gov governor of my state is. I just don't ever think about any of it. I don't ever interact with any of that stuff. I don't feel the need to have this information in my head. It does nothing for me. But I can indeed describe the philosophical implications of the modern Cartesian interpretation dealing with consciousness and humanity. It's ignorant, by the way. All this stuff is ignorance. But, um, yeah, I when I got my creativity back when I was 19... Um, I actually have this video, I haven't posted it yet, it's about, um, the definition of art. Um, I went on this, like, huge stream of consciousness, like, rant, trying to define art with actual constraints, somehow. And, uh, I'm so proud of that video. Because I did, I did poorly in regards to actually defining art, but I did so well compared to some of even the greatest minds in history who also try to define arts. Like, I'm super proud of that one. That is my most proud video I've ever made. Like, go to my second channel and look up definition of arts on it. And one of these days, you'll see it up there. I haven't uploaded it yet, but one of these days you'll see it. It's part of my streams. It'll be in my streams of consciousness. And you'll see the kind of mindset I was in when I was 19. That shit was next level, dude. Like, you'll see the peak, that was my peak right there of creativity. That describes perfectly what it was like in 2019. 
my most favorite contribution ever, by the way. That was it. That shit had me in tears by the end of it. So yeah, that was, I couldn't even sleep that day. I remember going to my mom and telling her that I had accomplished something amazing, but she probably wouldn't understand it, so she should just rest assured knowing I accomplished something really good, and she should be proud of me for that. My parents weren't the best with English, and um, philosophy is just language arts 2.0. Even if I were to explain it to my mom, the words wouldn't have the same meaning to her that they did to me. So yeah, that's that's my um that's my thing. I want I'm I'm going to watch this. I'm going to watch this definitely cuz I want to know. But um yeah. Yeah. When I was 19, I got my creativity back. It lasted for an entire year of 2019 and then for like a month and a half 2020. And then it stabilized, um, it just dropped down really, really low from what it used to be, but still very high relative, um, and, and just stayed stagnant there the entire time. But yeah, around the time I was 20 years old, I was making so many contributions. I can't even, I can't even just name one here. I have them on YouTube, actually. I don't even need to, like I have, I, I, I put streams of consciousness and stuff. <laughs> I didn't really, actually when I was 20, I wasn't really putting myself out there like that, not at this level yet. Um, but yeah, that was around the time where I stopped caring about looking like such a smart ass. I'm not that kind of dude anymore, not as much. It's slowly, slowly going away. I still do, uh, it's still a part of me, you know, but I, I still have that little, little bit of me that I had when I was a little kid, but it's slowly going away and I'm glad it is. I'm glad I'm, I'm being humbled. I, I realize now that all my wisdom and, and profundity was really just relatable words. It's all it is. And absurdity, too. It's just pointing out absurdities and things. Never actually coming to any conclusions, but just pointing things out. Make, complaining, complaining, but never uh, providing any solutions. Absurdism took over quite a bit of my thought process. And... Uh, <laughs> A lot of things, a lot of like tangible things uh, that I could put into words. Um, I would make an attempt and it would just dissolve the tip of my tongue before it can escape because I'd realize the absurdity of it all. And even though there would be a lot of profound things I could say to people that they would consider profound, I would consider it absurd. So it's not like a lot of these things are like super proud of that I can look back on and be like, damn, this is something, this is a contribution I made when I was 20. It's a, a lot of these are like personal truths. It's a personal journey. I've grown a lot in the past few years. When I was a little kid, I was like just some smart ass, know it all type of, like the type who would like wear glasses and attempt to write with both hands and I would, like claim to be a representative of all nerds around the world. Um, I would be the kind of kid who would like raise their hand to answer all the hard math questions, but not bother to raise their hand at the easy ones because I didn't want to look like I was doing easy questions. <laughs> Every time the teacher would be like, oh, who can answer this complicated math question? They wouldn't actually say that. That's, But every time they'd like be like, who can answer this question? And it'd be a hard one. Um, or they'd be like, oh, if you can answer this one, you can get candy. That was always me, every time. And the whole class was watching me. The only one. The only one eating candy. And I would hoard that. I would show off so much candy, dude. The the, the packets of life, the um, nerds, the chocolate truffles. Is the whole cake slice I got one time. Literally, I, I indulged in um, the amount of treats you got because usually it would be spread across the class and everyone raised their hand it would be like oh me me i want i want it i'll answer it and then you know somebody would answer it and it would go to different people every time not when i was in class i got it every time at least when it was in math if it was a difficult math question i always got it i was always on top of it but yeah that was that was me when i was little and i i, I still have a bit of that left in me only a tiny bit but a bit of it 
maybe more than I'd like to admit. I don't really like that kind of person. They're very arrogant. I really haven't been on that uh, knowledge and ideas streak since then, though. Since I was, like, 19. Not to say that I didn't come up with good ideas recently, just that when I was 20, I just stopped caring about showing them off. And uh, when I was 21, I went back to showing them off. <laughs> I'm kidding. I did put a lot of ideas on YouTube, though. I didn't really care about promoting them. They're just for when I can older, I can look back on them and see how far I've come or how far I've fallen. If you want to check them out, my YouTube is uh, somewhere on here. It might be, you might be watching this on my YouTube, actually, but it will be my second channel. Um, I have two playlists. One of them is called Free Ideas, where I give away business ideas for free for other people, like stuff I'm not going to use myself. And another place is called Stream of Consciousness, where it's a completely unscripted, for the most part, some of the videos have a bit of scripting, but it's usually unscripted rants. Um, as much as I don't want them to be rants, that's what they ended up being of all of my intrusive thoughts late night when I'm sleep deprived. Except for like two of them that I wrote bullet points for. And there's a few I had to delete. But other than those, it's it's just raw, unfiltered, intrusive thoughts. 